Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Tex Ags Radio. Welcome back to Tex Ags Stacked. I'm Billy Lucci. Olin Buchanan. Make a mistake. We're not going anywhere. This is going to be a great program, and we're building into a great program. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I stand by what we do and how we do it. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 right? ball, I gotta come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. All right, I know Nick's gonna get upset. We just had Brandon Leone walking through. This, this is like ESPN, right? You never know who's going to walk through the doors, right? Back in the day, Brandon's going to be uh, the receptionist for the day. Brandon, welcome. What's, What's up, up, buddy? Not much, man. Just hey. up here getting some work done, looking at some parking lots here in Bryan College Station. By the way, I should do the intro. It's Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. It is the go hour presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Nick, I'm sorry. You have to readjust the, uh, the cameras out there. For Brandon Leone, anything's possible. Hey, Ob. Hey, so what? What you, your your job is to acquire parking lots or what? <clears throat> Not to acquire them, to maintain and Main, repair oh, them. Yeah, oh, is that yeah. what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, oh, that, that's, that's exactly changed right. since you've left here. No, right? that's, no, that's, that's what you always did. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, let me just say because I don't get the chance to talk. To, I was, I was so impressed. With Brandon Leone's reaction on the uh, post game rap, post game rap, yep. the way, the passion, and how much he cares for this program, and I know I can, without being mean, you, by you the could, way, yeah, and you could just feel the frustration, the passion, and I applaud it. How are you feeling now? A couple days removed. I mean, I'm still frustrated. You yeah. know, I think just the undertone of just disappointment. You know, I just think. <clears throat> The opportunity that was there before us, before these last two games, I mean, just zooming out, you know, after Arkansas and Auburn, and you look at where we were headed and what was in front of us, you know, even despite all the questions with Jimbo and, you know, last season's uh, lack of performance, I guess you could say, I just thought to myself, like, man, what an opportunity we have before us. Like, this is a very down Alabama team coming to Kyle Field. We have so many opportunities. Defense is flying around the football. This guy is not someone that – I think is going to beat us when I was thinking of Milrow. Um, Same with Milton, I bet. <laughs> yep, for sure. Right, and you hold them to 100 yards passing. You're supposed yeah. to win that game. And so, and then even coming after <clears throat> Tennessee, to me, was probably even more frustrating than Alabama because I just have never seen a game where, like, the other team wanted us to win <laughs> so bad. Like, we had so many opportunities. And so, Both. speaking, Olin, I appreciate you. I think, mm-hmm. you know, I'm obviously very passionate about the program and, and want nothing but the best for every single person inside the bright complex obviously having you know spent time in there and and just i care a ton but i'm just disappointed man i just i'm disappointed for the kids i'm disappointed for our fans i mean it's like the everyone i talk to is this place of like ah it it is what it is you know that's a terrible place to be that's what i'm saying it's like this melancholy just like ah whatever that's garbage, man. I, we should I, not be there. I wish a program. I wish every and maybe they do. And I just I just wish every and I, or maybe I should put it. I hope every former player feels the same way and has the same connection to the program that they care that much even after they're playing. And by the way, you said you, th- you, you know we're in there thinking we're going somewhere. And we're, to me, it's like the every Aggie in the world was like my dog when I put him in the truck and he thinks we're going to the park <laughs> and we end sure. up at the vet. You know, he's all excited. Oh, all right. Like, what, wait, wait, wait. Wait, what? I, what this is going to hurt? Yeah. 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 I thought we were going to run around. Yeah, Chase no. We're just going to you know, be in the sun. But no, no we're I'm just going to get fixed. Yeah. Just going to get fixed. <laughs> yeah. Midway. Going to get neutered. <laughs> a little bit more than midway through the second half against Alabama, I realized, here we go again. And then Anias gave me a glimmer of hope, mm-hmm. right? But that's why I went into the Tennessee game. It's like, I've seen this story before. And I have no reason to believe it's going to be any different. It doesn't mean that they're going to be five and seven. I don't mean that at all. Yeah. But the 
it until they figure out the offense, which is I thought our conversation piece from last year. Mm-hmm. Here we are. Yeah, I, I think, and we touched on this just briefly in the post game. I mean, all you got to go do is look at just the second half performance of our offense in the last two weeks and just see three weeks, buddy. Yeah, no, that's three exactly weeks. right. Three weeks, but I'm in my mind. I'm thinking of just these two games that were such big opportunities for our team and our program and the direction in which it's headed. And so, you know, the talent is there, right? I mean, yeah, without like, a doubt. I mean, when I was here, this roster, just to remove opinions, like just look at the facts of the roster talent from when I was here. And there were some good players when I was here. This is one of the most talented rosters that's ever been compiled at A&M. And so, it, to me, it, it's just two and two together. What's going on? Something's missing because we have so many guys. I even watched someone tweeted – something yesterday and it was like a side by side of Connor hitting Ruben Owens on that same play where Max, you know, he missed mm-hmm. um Too short. Moss on the side. I mean Connor got it out right into his chest and Ruben Owens just you watch him on one play and you think this dude right here should be touching the ball 15, 20 times a game. And he's just down here. I mean there's I'm saying that because there's just so much talent. Um and we just we missed those opportunities and I'm just frustrated. I think ultimately that's that's the thing that, that is hard is um, I felt like Bama was down, Tennessee was down. We had an opportunity. Yeah, but they're down, but th- what does that make A&M? Yeah. Correct. That's, what's, that's the argument is like, you know, Bama fans are tweeting at me, if you're so frustrated, how does that make y'all look? I'm like, I know. It makes us look like it, crap. It, it, it's it like sucks. that show, uh, what's that show called, like Worst Cooks in America? You've got all the great Recipe. ingredients you need, mm-hmm. and you've got the, the, the best – uh, utensils available. Everything is available. You just keep putting out a, 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 a bad meal because you're not cooking it right. Best case scenario versus realistic scenario versus Armageddon. We know the three situations, right? Mm-hmm. Best case, which I see no path to there right now, nine and three. Because of talent. Uh, yeah. Realistic, seven and five. You don't win on the road, you win at home. Worst case, Worst case is five and seven. Yeah. And by the way, and I just, I, I it was a dramatic pause because it's like sinking in. Like we're really but, having this conversation you know, again. And we can say, yeah, they're going to get everything right in the bye week. But of course, last year they lost to South Carolina coming off the bye week. They did when they didn't show up to start the game, basically. But I look. Here's the thing. Here's why you should at least. I don't know confidence right but be re- cautiously optimistic is because not only do you have a lot of talent but at least to my what i see the those guys are talented and they're still playing hard yeah you know they haven't mailed it in yet yeah yeah i but i don't think i don't think that was the case even last year like i, I don't think that they didn't play hard well uh, there, there were some issues some issues and those guys left right so um i don't know i i most did i want to be I want to be optimistic about the rest of the way because Tennessee was a bad matchup for us. We knew that. They were a bad matchup for us. OB, you're holding back? I I thought A&M was a bad matchup for Tennessee. You know? And, again, bad matchup, whatever. You had a chance to win that game so many times. Yeah. And if they could just – But isn't that every hey, loss – that they've had in the last yeah, three years. Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. You know, again, I, I don't mean to oversimplify, but I and I and and just keep beating the dead horse. But a fourth and one, and the center is not covered. Just run a freaking quarterback sneak and keep <laughs> and go score. Well, why is it so damn hard? Why do coaches make coaching more difficult than it has to be? It happens a lot. It, it's it's. I think we even talked about that. It's like sometimes you're watching games and it's like, no matter what, like it's it's simple. Like oh, uncovered, go. They look at the car and I got to do this. I got to. Yeah, do this. yeah, you don't you even know? need to. I mean, that yeah. should be one of those things that look. It's just understood, right? Aren't you played football? Aren't there some plays like even like uh, even on special teams where if you get a certain look, there's just this play that you just do. You don't. Yeah. Right? Yeah, a lot of times there are. I mean, so, there's stuff so, built in. Hey, it's, it's understood between the quarterback and the uh, – uh, especially if you're under center, between the quarterback and the center, if you're not covered and we need a yard, hey, if, it, if it has anything, I tap you on the on the mm-hmm. hip and take the snap on the first sound and go. Yeah. But, no, we got to, like, sit there and move guys around and let the Tennessee guy shift over. Ten seconds into the, you know, it's just look. look 
I, I do want to say this. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I, I, I think every team, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get back to a point after I make this comment. Every team on their backup quarterback would struggle, right? Hold on. They, they would struggle. But I felt that Max was good enough to start, and I still feel he's good enough to start at other places in the SEC, okay? The last couple of weeks make me feel not as, as confident about that, which makes me then think it is the system. Something about this system that is other teams are out scheming in the second half of games. There is a problem with that. And now it has messed with your quarterback's confidence to where he can't get these throws. He's locked in a little bit too long. You need to simplify things to where he's got two, two and a half seconds. Find your, your guy and move on. Yeah. No, I mean, there's no question. I mean, we can go back and go, we can go listen to every single recap we did last year. It's the same. It's a rerun. It's like Groundhog Day. You know, I'm waiting for Bill Murray to pop out, you know, with a, driving his truck around, like going into town, doing yeah. the same thing over and over. But, you know, Max Johnson, I'll say this, I agreed with you. And, I, you know, it's the head coaches and the staff's responsibility to have a capable backup quarterback, you know, with all the things available now for recruiting. And we all thought Max was. And maybe he is. And maybe it is the system. I know Max Johnson's good enough to take 55 shots against us in the face when he was at LSU and still hang in there long enough to beat us at the very end, a Mike Elko defense. Yep. So I know Max Johnson has proved that he's tough, that he'll stay in there, that he can make the throws. And so whether it's the system, whether the poor guy, I mean, I've seen a couple of the stats, he's running for his life. I mean, genuinely, our offensive line is just getting baptized the last few weeks. But when he's not running for his life, because there are plays to be made, he holds on to it. So it's it's a both. It's a it's a both end, right? And so the whole the whole thing is like all of us care, man. Like it's just it's frustrating and it's disappointing because you know what's there. What's our guy's name? The, the young guy's blowing up. Josh Pate, um, just a freaking stud. And the little comment that he made is like, this place has every single thing necessary to win. And it's not just, we're not just saying that as Aggies. So, so then the question is why? Because different coaches, different players, different you know vibes around the program, it continues to underwhelm. Yeah, I, listen, ultimately, you know, I, I work for a phenomenal company that has some amazing leaders in it. Um, things are going extremely well. And here's what I can tell you. It all starts with leadership. I don't care if it's a small business, if it's a home, if it's a marriage, if it's parenting, if it's football, if it's baseball, if it's track. Coaching makes a difference. Leadership makes a difference. And there's just no way around it. And at some point when you do something so much for so long and the results aren't there, it's really clear. You know, I think what 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 the issue is, and so whether it's a lack um, of humility and an unwillingness to change and do new things, or empower maybe other people that have new thoughts and concepts, um, you know, like they always say, a zebra doesn't change his stripes. Sometimes that's true, right. right outside of the grace of God. I think sometimes that's very true with people, especially in business or in coaching, right? That people want to just stick to what they know, and so maybe that's what it is. I don't know, but what I do know is. There's everything necessary across the street in the Bright Complex to win football games at a very high level. I'm watching Missouri head towards 10 wins. It makes me sick to my stomach. Oh, will give you a dollar if you get that phone off the thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so anyways, again, it's just it's frustrating. It's not personal. Dude, I mean, I you have no idea. Go back, read my posts from the last five years. I've probably been apologetic over the top wanting this guy to succeed here. I think he's a, I love him. I love it. I think he's a good fit at A&M, mm-hmm. all the things. I want it to work out. I don't know if it's going to. I, it doesn't seem like it's trending that direction after the last two weeks <clears throat> because it feels like you and I have had the same conversation in every post game for the last yeah. two years together. Yeah. The same ones, the same frustrations. And we had some of those in the first year too, in 21. Like it, it, even though that was a better year, yeah. the Alabama game, I think also gave us false... What's the word I'm looking for? False uh, optimism where, where we're going, yeah. right? And it was a great win, and they're good for Huge win. Yeah. they're good for a big win every year. For sure. Well, but I I need nine to ten yeah. good we wins need 10, every year. Dude, we need ten. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't you don't go out and shoot a par, and then uh, bogey every other hole and say, hey, we had a great round. Only I do that. <laughs> so I know what you're saying. I'd be happy with one ball. Okay. You don't throw one strike yeah. and throw nine gutter balls <laughs> and say, hey, man, I'm, a, well, I'm ready for the PBA. Yeah, for real. But, but at the end of the day, this is the situation that they're in. Correct. This is it. So we can get Matt. Look, 
be mad, be apathetic, be uh, overly enthusiastic, whatever you, however you fan, do it. This is where they're in. It is up to those guys across the street, players and coaches, to figure it out. Yeah, and listen, I promise you, no one wants uh, them to figure it out more than us. Like, we, you know, you guys have to talk about it every single day and write about it and think about it and process it and replay things. They're doing the same thing. They're watching film, and so that's what I'm saying. Like leadership. It changes everything. And so hopefully whatever's going on from a leadership standpoint amongst the players. Can teams change? Can teams change? Oh, yeah. It, it, absolutely they can. You, it. you see it all the time in, okay. in baseball uh, a lot. You see it in football. Over a three-year period. Can they change? So, like, can you change to the positive, not to the negative? I'm yeah. saying after two, three years, same administration, same program, mm -hmm. can things get significantly better? Yes. Yeah. It, can things get better this season? Yeah, I, I absolutely you think absolutely they can. can. It, it, and I, I believe that they can. I think, again, you know, it flows down from the top, man. I'd love to see some, like, inverted pyramid-style leadership. You know, I'd like to see some difference um, in how things are done. Didn't, shake some didn't we think up. that was happening this offseason? I mean, I thought it was. Y'all you know, so. are closer to it than me. but I, Well, we thought it was like up it. until uh, – Connor got hurt. Well, probably up until last week. I, even that you came out of Alabama mad because you had the opportunities. Mm hmm but you you saw the the ability. You say, okay, all right, you've lost to Alabama. You, yeah, dang it, we're better than them. Had the opportunity, you let them get away. But you know that talent wise, you can get. And then you go and let and and you follow that up against Tennessee. You're like, okay, now, now I don't know. No, now I mean, do you really think South Carolina can keep A and M to three points in the second half? Because I don't. I think I, you know what you're right. I don't think. In fact, I'll say I know South Carolina cannot keep A and M to three points. However, it's my Stephen A. Smith. However, however, A and M can keep A and M from getting three points. That, that's that's the thing that's frustrating about the last few weeks is A and M has been. You know, Jimbo always talks about. It doesn't matter who's on the schedule. You know, what matters is, is us and what we can control us and we got to execute. And we haven't executed, yeah. right? And I'm so tired of hearing that word. But, like, A&M has gotten in its way more than the other team has the last two weeks. I know you got a, a meeting to get to. Thank you for stopping by, man. Yeah, absolutely. Do that more often. Appreciate you I like, guys. I like that yeah. you popped Always in. Good to okay. see you. Hey, uh, pave over paradise and put up a parking lot. <laughs> OB, yes, I, got, I got an idea. <laughs> tell me if you like this idea. I like it. Next time, when he gives us a little bit more warning, we'll, we'll take on the Fargo's. Uh, that would be awesome. I'm mm. sure he would like it too, I because mean, well, it depends on the day too. Yeah, that's true. Well, today's Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, so you know, we'd have to call up early and get some rib tips. Because if you want to, like rib tips, love rib tips. If you oh, want to, if if you <laughs> want to impress a, a guest, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, rib tips. Tuesday. But maybe they don't like ribs, which I can't understand. I mean, but if they, they don't, communist or tips, you know, <laughs> they can get everything. You know, you can get all the other things that you love from barbecue. You can get you some some sausage or some some uh, some pork ribs or some beef ribs. Some people go to barbecue Some places sausage. for the meat. I go for the Brisky. meat and the sides there, especially on yeah, Thursdays. I know, yeah, because Thursday you got the macaroni and cheese. You like macaroni and cheese? I love macaroni Who and cheese. Who doesn't, right? I'm a big side guy. Yeah, uh, big side what's guy. the place we went to, Daniel, in Houston? You <laughs> took us to for the lunch and learn? Yeah. Jay Bar M in downtown Houston, uh, phenomenal barbecue place. Yeah, but I bet they're not. I bet they don't have the. Uh, but they're not the best barbecue. Uh, well, they're not the best barbecue in Texas, i.e., the world. Why, why is that? Because that would be Fargo's. You know why I say that? Why? Because <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you know, uh, Texas Monthly had them as one of the top fifty barbecue joints in the world. <sighs> yeah, I, I'm, I would say number one. Yep, seventeen hundred one South Texas Avenue in Bryan, without a doubt, the what? The best barbecue in Texas, i.e. The world. That's your trademark. I already told you it's true. It's true. All right. Far goes.
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. A formal introduction now of the Heisman Trophy voter and my buddy Olin Buchanan. Buddy, hello. Hello, everybody. I like that voice. It was a little bit more. Hello, everybody. We had Brandon Leone. You know, we've got to get him on. You got to get him on. And again, so much, gosh, so much passion and love for that A and M program. Yeah. You know, you want everybody especially players, former players, to feel that way, well, especially current players, you know, you, to, to, to have that same love and passion for the program. So you're going to leave for Alabama later on today. Yeah. Tell, the people, why, tell the people why. Well, I'm going to the uh, SEC basketball media days. So we're going to be uh, visiting with Joni Taylor and, and some of her players uh, tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we'll be visiting with uh, Buzz Williams, Boots Radford, and uh, Wade Taylor. At, and uh, – you know, I think A and M might 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 be number one. I don't think so, but they could be picked number one in the preseason poll. I would not be surprised. In fact, I'd be surprised if Wade Taylor is not the uh, preseason player of the year. He may not be, but I'm, you I'm would not. be surprised. I know I voted for him, and I know somebody else that but, from another uh, who covers another uni- uh, university in the SEC voted for Wade Taylor. And I that's think two a lot right of there. Others w- I think I would think a lot of others would too. I hope so. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. Uh, they came in at what number fifteen? Number fifteen in the AP and nineteen in the coaches' poll. I wonder. I, I, I wonder what's the highest A and M has ever entered. And and Luke has given me a. a, a Should we go to the Angry yeah. Elephant using social? Yeah, because Luke's going to answer the question of what's the highest A and M basketball has uh, let, let ever me, entered. A, let me oh. let me guess. Let me guess. Two thousand six. They came in at number nine. You must have saw my tweet no, that I no, put out I, the other 100% day. I didn't. I covered that. Okay. Team. That's no, why. Okay. Number nine. It was 2006, 2007. They entered the year at number 13. Okay, that was close. And then in 1990 or in 1980, they entered at number 14. So 15th is tied for the third highest start. Yeah, I uh, I covered those teams, and it was it was a good run. <laughs> the AC Law, Joseph Jones years were. Oh, and Logan, as well. And Logan Lee, yeah, Logan Lee. Uh, Logan Lee he was he was uh, quite the contributor. He, he could hit some shots. I would go on as Chris far, Walker, too. I love Chris Walker. I would go on as far as to say about Logan Lee, and gosh, I hope Logan's listening. But I would say that at that time, no Logan Lee was probably the best half Chinese point guard in America. And Tanis Kavalaskis was also on that team. See how I glossed over that? <laughs> Oh boy, I, I I miss Logan. You know, his office was right across uh, from mine, and we used to have a lot of good banter. Yeah, I I, I miss him as well. Let's uh, check in with Nick Savage, who's behind the glass. We haven't talked to Nick this morning. Uh, Nick, we made you work a little early. Good morning, buddy. Yeah, it's funny because I, I heard the doorbell ring at like right at eight o'clock when our show starts, and I like peeked around the corner and saw someone I didn't recognize. I was like, hey, no one go answer the door. I don't I don't know who that is. Don't worry about it. And uh, it was Brandon Leone, so I feel bad. So I, I guess Did I partially— Did you see his friend that was here? His yeah, co-workers that's who I, I saw. Who saw. Yeah. I did not see Brandon, so that's partially on me. But, uh, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise to get him in here. Yeah, it was good to see him. What 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 else is going on with you? Well, I, I remember Drew on our YouTube chat yesterday was trying to to bring up a point, and, and I found what he was talking about. So he's talking about Max and the time he has to throw. And right now on quarterbacks with 25-plus dropbacks— Johnson is ranked 14th in average time to throw with about three seconds to throw. That's tied 19th uh, this season, uh, despite having the worst pressure rate nationally. So um, just that's that's what yeah, Drew wanted I mean, me to bring up. My eyes tell me something different. Uh, last week he looked like a poor, you know, Max Johnson pinata. Andy and, everywhere. And well, I'm just thinking he in the in Tennessee defense all were bringing the stick. They were bringing the stick. <laughs> well, look. There were times that he had time. There were. And there's also times that he had no time. I what, what, And I wonder what that does to your psyche, yeah, the David Carr you, effect. You start, you start, I think uh, I heard Lucci say, uh, like, you start, you start seeing ghosts even when they're not there because you've, you've been hit so much. So this is completely random and nothing to do with the topic, but something to do with the topic. Remember when I got bit by, was it Green Hornet, whatever they were, in my eye a couple of weeks, a month ago or so? You remember that story? <laughs> Don't. You know the story? I don't. Some hornet, like I was mowing the lawn, and like three hornets attacked my eye, and it blew up. And oh. yeah, it was, and it, it did not feel good. 
Yes. I had PTSD from that every time I went in that back part of the backyard. <laughs> oh, I was like, I don't know if I want to cut here. Like, and like, I, I'm not even thinking about it. And the moment I see like that area, I'm like, oh no, I, I, I need to avoid. If that happened to me with a freaking hornet, that's in 47 years of life has never happened. Right. Imagine a quarterback who feels like he's getting hit on every other play. I feel for the guy. I, I do, and he's a tough kid. We we saw it when Michael Clemens was making him a pinata. Yeah, that's true. And he stayed in there and 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 delivered. And but but this is getting ridiculous. And I know those guys, those offensive linemen. Ever a lot of a lot of other programs wanted them. And at some point, you have to say, did you miss on everybody, or is there some issue with the blocking scheme or the way they're being taught? Or something. I understand that you can have the perfect blocking scheme and they'll teach them great. And sometimes you're going to make mistakes. That that that's just under that's just a fact. But th- there is a disconnect there that somehow has to get remedied. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, buddy, it's now time for the Apex Performance of the Week, and we do have a couple performances to discuss here. Apex Performance of the Week presented by Apex Health. Feel like you're losing your edge? It could be low testosterone, increase your energy, sharpen your focus, and boost your performance with a custom treatment plan from Apex Health. Learn more at apexhealthclinic.com. Apex Health Clinic is owned and operated by a veteran, and they serve the Brazos Valley. All right, my friend, do you have one you want to go with? Uh, well, the, the, the most obvious... Uh, is Noah Thomas? Yep. What a game that that guy had! You might want to target him more than three times with the with the uh, catches he was making. Yeah, I sure would like to see you get close. You know, you got a six six guy who can jump long. That's the guy you might want to uh, think about a fade when you get close to the, you know, to the to the goal line. Unfortunately, when he made that huge, I think it was a third down catch to put him inside the uh, eleven yard line. I had no faith that they were going to be able to punch it in. Oh, I didn't either. Had they punched it in? Might have won the game. Probably win the game. Very good chance you win the game. Yeah. Very good chance. If you get 11, of course, I think they had a busted play on the first play, and now you're behind the chains. And, and we knew. And we, in fact, I, did, did I not? You I mean, told me in the press box. Okay, there, it's going to be a field goal. You said they're going to kick a field goal. At least they got it. <laughs> this is true. Uh, let's <laughs> do one more. Do you, do you have a defensive player in mind? Because I got one for you. Uh, well, you, I, you know, th- there are several you could. but. Yep. I know the one you're going to say. Which so one am I going to say? Torian York. Yeah. Nine tackles, um, six solo, two tackles for loss. Guy, guy played well. Guy played very well. Forced How? a fumble. I forgot about that. That's right. I want to say Josh DeBerry. Had a pick. A huge pick. Scrutiny. It huge. could have been the turning point in the game. It could have been. Huge pick. And you know what? When the guy's been, been criticized – you know, for some issues against Alabama, then you know what? Recognize. If you're going to criticize, then also recognize. And he – I just came up with that, by the Johnny way. Johnny Cochran is here. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, if you must criti- criticize uh, – You must recognize. Recognize. So, uh, yeah, uh, he, that was a huge interception. And I don't remember him not, you know, not having a, a – you know, a, anything other than a very, very good game. So – what, when you don't notice a DB other than good plays, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's a good thing. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You, so, uh, especially after being picked on so much the week prior. Right, right. Very nice to have a bounce you back. You could have been, you, could, you as a, a defensive back, you could have been like Max and, you know, feeling a little bit shell-shocked. Yep. But no, you came right in there and, and I think I can remember a good tackle he had on a, a – Seems like one of those uh, hitch passes or something. Yep. But uh, I thought he played a very solid game. And then that interception took a solid game up to a very good game. That, that interception was huge. It gave you a chance, and it, it snuffed out a great opportunity for Tennessee. Yeah, it did. It 100% did. And by the way, you, if you're Tennessee, I know you're feeling good about that win, but you're, also th- you're doing what you did uh, after the Auburn game, I believe. Like, In Arkansas. Yeah, like all these mistakes. You overthrow guys. You drop balls for touchdowns. Uh, you throw an interception in the red zone, like against a real team, that becomes a huge disaster. Well, you don't win. But you know what? They did those things. Now, now the one drop pass, they still scored on that on that series. Was it a field goal on this series? No, I think they got a touchdown. That touchdown. Yeah, they, so they still got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because wasn't there a late hit? Oh, uh, on the quarter was it quarterback? Uh, yeah, qu- rough in the quarter. It yeah. wasn't late. It just got him in the in yeah. the head. It was. I yeah, I, I, it was. It was one of those things that before 
you know, football became very pansified. Um, you know, no one would think anything of it. But they yeah. still scored. And you know what? Tennessee did all that against one of the best defenses in the country. Yep. So if I'm a Tennessee fan, I'm actually – Hey, if, if you can do that against A&M's defense, you can do that. You can do even more against Alabama this week. It just reminded me. <laughs> one of the talking points last year. If you just, this is my talking mm-hmm. point. You just have the middle of the road offense. You're yeah. going to win a bunch of games. It's true. And we had better than middle of the road entering the SEC. I should have said in SEC play. I should have, if you have middle of the road offense, and if you have middle road offense against Bama, against Tennessee, do you win? Uh, middle of the road, yeah, you're four and zero. You're four and zero right now. If you could, if you could just get out of your own way with but, the, the the recurring mistakes, you know it's not a mistake, Ob. Oh, you don't know because I haven't even told you what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, yeah, tell me. It's, it has something to do with clothing. Oh, charge apparel. Yeah, charge apparel. Guys, doesn't matter your body size. Doesn't matter if you're tall, skinny. I think I used the term yesterday on the other side of skinny. Right? Doesn't matter. If you get a Charge Apparel shirt, it's going to fit the right way. Uh, I highly recommend checking out the website. We're talking high-quality stuff, like the the top clothing out there for polos and tees. Uh, they do it the right way out there. They are Aggie-owned and operated. A couple of really cool dudes, Travis and Tucker, who met in the, uh, in the core here at Texas A&M. And uh, they want to make sure that you know that 12% of their total sales, not just the profits, are donated to veteran nonprofit partners where they focus on mental health initiatives or owed to the 12th man. And again, it is going to fit you the right way. When you see the clothing, the the maroon polo, awesome. I know right now you're you're you're, you're a little hurt for what's happened football wise, but you love being an Aggie. Get the maroon polo. They got other ones too. I think I wore my gray one on Friday. The clothes are amazing. You're going to love what you see from them. And uh, I'm just telling you, it's, it it is the best uh, clothing when it comes to tees and to polos. Check out the website, thechargerapparel.com. Find them on Instagram, the Charger Apparel, or on X, X, excuse me, the Charge Brand.
We're back. But you knew that. Tech Stacks Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour, presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. David Nuno, Olin Buchanan. And at the hotline, we are joined by Shereen Williams, Pro Football Talk, <laughs> Hall of Famer, and uh, Aggie Opinion person. Hello, Shereen. Good morning. <laughs> I like Aggie Opinion person. Don't all Aggies have opinions? Don't we all, right? Uh Shereen, yeah. hey, wait, wait. Shereen, my apologies for bothering you last night, texting you with my frustration with the Cowboys. Cowboys. Yeah, <laughs> it turned out okay for you all enough. Yeah, actually, when it was all said and done, I had a I had a good sports night yesterday or sports day yesterday. Yeah. Well, Shereen, Saturday mm-hmm. wasn't a good sports day. So, um, just where are you with this program? The future, the now, all of it. Well, it hasn't been a good sports weekend for me, personally, with the Aggies losing and the Astros losing twice, but neither here nor there. Yeah, you know, I, I thought it was their worst performance as App State. They just didn't play well in any phase of the game. I mean, nothing. Uh, the coaching wasn't there. The special teams wasn't there. The defense wasn't there. The offense wasn't there. It was all around team effort, if, if you want to look at it like that, because I, I can't look at that game and pick out anyone who played well. I thought Edron Cooper played really well before he got hurt. Mm-hmm. Other than that, there's there's just nothing in that game that was even passable. I mean, it just wasn't good. And Except for Noah Thomas. Play like that. And I think we... Yeah, and Noah Thomas played well. I, you know, but I think we're figuring out why Max is the backup quarterback. And when you lose your starting quarterback, this is usually what happens. He's a better backup quarterback than we've had in past years. He's, you know, if, if everybody else plays really, really well around him, you have a chance to win, but no one else played well around him. They certainly, he showed his toughness because he got killed in that game. That, that I saw the percentage of pressures, and it was incredible. I can't remember exactly what it was, but whatever it was, it was over-the-top pressures. Almost every time he dropped back, he was pressured. And part of that is because they couldn't run the ball. So Tennessee knew exactly what they were going to do. But, you know, you do wonder if if Connor was out there, how things would have been different the last two games. Would they have been better in some of those red zone opportunities they got, especially early against Alabama? You know, you do wonder all those things. It's just, you know, it's disappointing to to think that they were going to be a lot better. And I do think they're better than last year, but a lot better than last year. And and so now here you are, and they've, They've got a tough stretch here to try to go and win out after this bye week. Shereen, that's, I guess that's part of my frustration is that, you know, you have three years of backup quarterback play, basically, and I just want yeah. results. I don't care about what happens. I just want to see the results that, as an Aggie fan, that I expect, um, and, and they're not there regardless of the situation, injuries and offensive issues, whatever it may be. I just want the results. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and we haven't seen that, and, and I think that's what's so disappointing. We look at the talent levels and the recruiting classes and, and where they rank. They've been there. We've got some good offensive lines. So why isn't the offensive line better? I mean, it's no better than it was last year or the year before or the year before that. They're still pretty good. I mean, I, you know, Mike Sherman wasn't a very good head coach, but he was an elite offensive line recruiter. He knew what he was looking for, and I longed for those, longed for those days that, that we had Jake Matthews at right tackle because Luke Jokel was so good at left tackle and you had him there for three years because they came in and played as freshmen and were great as freshmen and stayed in those positions. And then you look at the guards that you had those years. So, you know, I, I it, we got to do better on the offensive line. Bill Parcells always said you win games on the offensive line and the defensive line. And we're losing games on the offensive line, and we have now for, for three years. And the offensive line's got to be better than, than what it's been. I think the defensive line has played really well um, since the first couple of games this season. They've played great. Best defensive line I think we've had here in many years, probably since Miles was here. So, you know, I, I do think they've improved there, and they've improved defensively from what they were last year. But I'm with you. You got to show the results, and the only result that matters is the one with the, the win loss column. And you're sitting here now trying to figure out. I mean, I'm going through. Are we going to get to six wins? I think we're going to get to six wins. I know we can get to five wins. You know, are, are, are we going to beat South Carolina? I don't know. Like, 
if you can't score more than 13 points, all these games are going to be tough. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I d- ditto. I, I, I'm with, amen. You know, all those things. And, uh, you know what, Shereen, that, that, that really bothers me is that I feel like they wasted a talent like, uh, Devon A. Chain. And now I'm worried yeah. that, you look at guys you've had that, that you're not always going to have guys like McKinley Jackson and Shamar Turner and Anaya Smith. And are you going to waste these guys too? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a legitimate question. Christian, go back to Christian Kirk. I think yeah. the same thing there, but we, we finally saw 18 in the LSU game do what he should have been doing all year. If you played him like that, the whole entire, you know, you might have killed him. You might have worn him out because you see what happened to Miami now with the knee injury. He's on the injured reserve for four games. Unfortunately, it's only four games, by the way. But, you know, maybe maybe you wear him out doing that, but you see the type of fact that he could be. You saw it in that LSU game, and unfortunately that was his last game of his career, but I agree with you. You know, the, the, the thing is, though, Owen, well, they keep getting the talent over and over and over again. It's just not producing in the win column. And and so you start to go, okay, what changes can we make to get there if we're actually getting the talent and not getting the results? And I think that's that's starting to be obvious. I mean, I, I think Jimbo's now under a lot of pressure to have to win out or at least only one more loss the rest of the way. I, I think there's a lot of pressure on him right now to, to get this done this year and show, hey, I'm going to have all these guys back. I'm getting Connor back. I've got a top three recruiting class. Give me one more year. And and that may not be enough. I don't know. But but the talent has been there, I think. Um, some of the – they've made some recruiting misses, as we know, particularly in that vaunted class, number one recruiting class. They made some mistakes. But they have enough talent, and, and they have enough talent. They have, have enough talent to beat Alabama this year. They have enough talent to beat Tennessee this year. And it's disappointing that you didn't at least split those games. I thought they would at least split those games at minimum. They didn't do that. Shereen, let's get into Aggies in the NFL. Well, it wasn't a really great week for them, but, I, you know, number three, I'm going to give Miles Garrett. He didn't have any sacks, but I don't know if everyone realizes what the Browns defense is doing. You probably don't see many Browns games in Bryan College Station or elsewhere in Texas. They have, the few, they have given up the fewest yards through five games since the 1971 Colts. They are playing at a historic level. I mean, historic. They beat the 49ers on defense the other day, and he's a big reason why. Three tackles and a quarterback hit. Again, no sacks, but he opens things up for everybody else in that defense and just playing terrific. If he keeps playing like he's playing, then the Browns defense keeps doing what they do, and I think he's got a great chance to be decent to player of the year. Um, let's go number two. Well, I, there's two guys. I'm going to have four, so he'll be number. Miles will be number four. Brayden Mann's going to be number three. I have to mention him because you know the Jets cut him and, and were fed up with him, and he played the Jets with the Eagles, and he had two punts for 81 yards, a 40.5 average, a long of 41, and he had one inside of the 20. So he's playing really well. Not, he doesn't have to punt that much, and it's probably a good thing. But playing well now with the Eagles could get him a Super Bowl ring if things work out the way he wants it to. Then we go, number two, uh, Christian Kirk. I haven't mentioned his name a ton. Three catches, 49 yards, and a touchdown, 29-yarder. They beat the Colts. And number one is uh, Justin Matabuke. Five tackles, two sacks, four quarterback hits. He played great for the Ravens this weekend. Shereen Williams here on uh, Tech Sacks Radio. Shereen, thank you for everything. Appreciate you. Hopefully we'll have a better sports week here in the next week. Well, at least for, for your Thank Astros. you, guys. Thank you. Well, hopefully we won't. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See you, Shereen. <laughs> I'm telling you, I know you can blame for what happened with, uh, with the Astros, but we're not going to get into that here. Hey, if I'm an Astros fan, I'm thinking, oh, down, down 2-0, we got the Rangers right where we want them. Hey, shows have <laughs> been down that road before. Uh, against the Rays, uh, they didn't end That's up what I'm saying. They, they were down three games to none. They forced a game seven. They ended up losing. I, I, refuse, that was in 2020. I refuse to allow myself to start believing that Rangers are going to win. So that way, if they do, I'm pleasantly surprised. Honestly, outside of a bad weekend to end the regular season, they've been hot. Other than that, right before that, 
and right after that, they've been really hot. But anyway, maybe we'll do a Heritage film on uh, Olin Buchanan's <laughs> love for the Rangers here <laughs> at, at some point. So check out Heritage Films. Go to the website is yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com, and uh, get a documentary done about your family, your family business, your family ranch. Get that story told, and then get everybody in your family together, right? Let's say you're doing Grandpa. Grandpa Bob. He's a great guy. I love Grandpa Bob. He's got a great story to tell. He tells a story about how your family kind of all came together and how he met his wife, how, you know, your dad, whatever the story may be. And then as a family, you guys all watch it with your kids and then maybe later their kids. And you share that great moment with your family in a Netflix style documentary done by Chance McLean and his company. So that's one option you have. You also have the year flicks, which are these 20 minute Q and A videos, usually reserved for the youngers, right? So you can do one with your, your, High school age kid, freshman year, sophomore year, kind of tell each year's story about how things have changed, stuff that they're into. You can do it in college, freshman, sophomore year. You can do it 12 years old, whatever. 20-minute awesome videos that Chance puts together. That's called Year Flicks. Again, the website is yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com, 713-893-8341, 713-893-8341. Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse of CC Creations, Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. He's Owen Buchanan. I'm David Nuno. And at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center, we have Luke. The Angry Evangelist. Yeah, the Angry Evangelist. Luke, I, I'm going to tell you, 
I know you always think, oh, David looked at the, the... – when my team loses, I avoid all sports. Mm -hmm. That's just how I roll. I'm, I didn't watch the Astros Rangers yesterday, right? I didn't. Right. I don't care. I mean, I care. I was keeping up the score. It was funny. I'd Google it. But I'm just, I'm just angry at all sports. Everybody's to blame. So with that information, do what you may. Okay, let's start off, uh, guess the line, with number seven, Penn State, at number three, Ohio State. Ohio State by a point and a half. Ohio State by four. It's four and a half. Huh. And then we've got yeah. number seven, t number 17, Tennessee at number 11, Alabama. Alabama by six and a half. Alabama by seven. Yeah. It's a nine and a half. Okay, yeah. gracias. Next up, we've got David Nuno versus Nick Savage in a football game. Um, what are we, are we tackling? Yes. Everything. Oh, I'd kill him. I mean, he'd probably burn me on a few routes, but once I tackle him, he's not getting up. Um, I don't know how fast either guy is. I, I always I'm go not for fast. speed. I'm not fast at all. Well, I'd, go, I, I'd go David Nuno minus seven. Really? So the even the he's got well he, then I gotta take Nuno. He he could I mean if the if the guy who's competing even <laughs> says I'm losing, then of course. I mean if it's just routes, he's gonna win some, oh, yeah. he'll lose some. If it's actual Me like minus twenty eight. If it's actually like getting hit. Well, like yeah, somebody's a quarterback for both half. teams. Somebody's huh? a quarterback for both teams. Or or somebody Billy can be the quarterback. Both of you have team. a quarterback. Yeah, you, but there's gotta be running the ball too. Again, David. It's gotta be, time it's gotta be Let's Petrino's go. offense. If we have Petrino's offense or Jimbo's offense, I got a chance. So the official Vegas line that I received was David Nuno minus two and a half. So they're not giving you as much credit. You guys realize I'm like, how old was George Foreman when he became the champion? Uh, like 40? 50, 50, I don't know. Yeah, I'm like George Foreman. Old. Like, it's, I mean, I, I, I probably bet on myself, but let's mm -hmm. be honest, guys. The guy's in the prime of his youth. All right, well, let's get two more in here. Uh, let's go Ryan Broninger versus that bathroom out there. Okay, this thing got oh, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Broninger wins that one, you know, because Broninger doesn't win, the bathroom loses. <laughs> I'm not big on bathrooms. I mean, of course I've, you know what I mean. I just, yeah, never mind. Any other football games? Yeah, one more real one, and let's get number 13, Ole Miss at Auburn. Ole Miss by nine and a half. Okay, I'll say Ole Miss by 12. It's Ole Miss by only six, which really? is very How interesting. Hmm. And then finally, Texas A&M versus the bye week. Luke's all about the one-liners today. I'll, I'll take A&M against the bye. <laughs> and A&M a by one. <laughs> In the first half of the bye week. <laughs> yeah, the second half of the bye week is going to be a problem. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, OB. When we come back, the real McCoy, Jamie McCoy, not as optimistic, believe it or not. That and more next on TechSags.
All right, we are back. Grumpy, whatever you want to call it. It's Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here on the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the hotline. We're joined by the real McCoy, Jamie McCoy, here on Tech Sags Radio. Jamie, you and I were going back on and forth on text yesterday. You're like, don't expect optimistic Jamie this week. They finally broke me. You're broken? I'm broken. <laughs> I'm broken like, uh, shoot, one of the horses or something out in Yellowstone. It's uh. It's been a sad weekend for the Aggies, man. I do a uh, I do a Monday dinner with a group of Baylor Bears and two Longhorns, and both of them had bye weeks, so I was the only one. Uh, everybody piled up on yesterday, so taking my lumps as the Aggies are. This should be a bye week of getting healthy, getting some stuff figured out, and figuring out how we uh, get this train moving forward. Yeah, well, I'm going to read this text that came in. It's called A Different Perspective is how it's titled, right? A non-ranked team with a backup quarterback lost on the road to a top 20 team by one score with a chance to win on the final possession. Remove the names of the team and 99% would expect the top 20 home team to win, which I agree with, but I got a follow-up to that. So, and this is what I said to him. I love that in a vacuum. Unfortunately, this vacuum has been three years long. Right, like it's it's always that story, and I'm looking for a program to break through. That's my problem. It's not losing at Tennessee. It's how they continuously lose games that I feel they're a play away from winning. Make that play every once in a while. That's that's what I'm upset about. Oh yeah, absolutely, and I, I feel your pain. Um, not only is it make that play, but it seems in the last few years. We got to be the number one program at beating yourself. We are number one hands down at, hey, you don't worry about doing anything. We'll take care of it on our end. We'll drop a pass. We'll uh, muff a punt. We'll kick a bad punt. We'll miss a field goal. We'll miss a tackle. We'll miss an interception. We'll tip a ball and have it go right to their guy. So it seems like whether it's our nature and we do it, we do it to ourselves or whether just the the football gods are unhappy with us or whatever it may seem to be, but it's um, I, I agree with you. We we've got to find a way, whether it be a player, whether it be a defensive guy, whether it be a coach. Somebody has to do something that says we're not taking this anymore. We're changing it. This is not going to be our mo. Um, I'm going to be the person that changes that. Um, somebody just has to step up. Uh, and it, it I don't know if it's the head coach, the quarterback, the backup quarterback. I'm not sure who, but we got to have somebody be that 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 fork that we need. Here's a, a stat that just it hurts to read it out loud. I've read it. I read it yesterday. I'll read it today. A&M is 4-8 and eight since 2021 in one-score games. And at the top of my head, I can, I can tell you those wins. Colorado. Okay. Remember how that game went? Oh, yeah. Came down to the very end, you know, and almost didn't happen. Okay. Colorado. Um, Alabama, 41 to 38. Love that one. That was fun, right? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Miami last year, eight point game. And uh, Arkansas last year. That's your, that's your four wins. Man, that's, um, that's, not a, that's not a good tell for a football program, especially for the years running. Um, I hate that we can't win on the road since or beat a ranked team on the road since 14 or whatever it seems. Um, when you when you take a step back, it's obviously the question is there. Do you is, does it start at the top? Do we need a new chief in command? Um, and we're kind of behind the eight ball as far as contract and what we would have to do to make a change there. And to be honest, a lot of people point to the coach. Man, this is uh to me, this is a lot of accountability with the players. Um, I know Jimbo's not saying go out there and miss a ball. Dude, I've heard the pregame speech, I've heard the postgame speech, I've heard the pressers. I I don't think it's the coaching. I think it's accountability on these guys. Of Isn't saying, that coaching as well though? When it when it, it, it when it boils down to it, it is coaching because you got to be the just like uh, in a, in the NFL game. The quarterback is saying stuff in the huddle, but he's got a coordinator or whoever it is in his ear. You've got to be that presence in their ear, and they've got to know your voice and 
know your mantra during the game, whether it, uh, I, I think back to my time in Pittsburgh, you just knew from Tomlin saying it all the time, situational football, uh, don't beat yourself. No, every, every opponent you're playing is a nameless gray face. There's so many things that I can remember with Tomlin, even having not played there in 10 years where it sticks. I don't know if something's not sticking um, with what Jimbo is uh, giving to the guys. And it has to be not sticking because every facet of the game, whether it be special teams, defense, or offense, somebody in some fashion has made a play. We missed a hot read. We had a punt that went 20 yards and set up the whole – in my opinion, with that little two, three-minute span where we punted, went 20 yards, they punted, pinned us inside the one, and then we punt back and they returned it for a touchdown. That was the game right there. Everything else, mistakes happen, but that little window right there is what changed the game. They couldn't score on us, and then they scored and took the lead, and we were playing catch-up. It just – there's so many little things. So, yes, it is coaching, but I would put it at 30% coaching. Really? Some of this some of this is players. Like, when Max is sitting there waiting for uh, Moss to look at him on the hot read, and it, for us as fans, you say, he's wide open. Why didn't you just – man, that should have been a little swing pass, and the safety had to come around everybody, so it should have been an easy first down. But little stuff like that, like I said, we are the king. We're the number one team at beating ourselves, whether it be a different facet of the game. We've got to clean that up, and it's coaching, but it's also these players got to say, man, I'm not going to be the guy. It always used to be do your 111, get your job done, and half the time our guys aren't doing that. And I, I, I think there's blame to go all around, right? But when it's three years of that kind of losing – you know, and like, again, the offense, I don't get it, man. They brought in a brilliant mind and I, I saw, and I, and I do understand no Connor makes a difference, Yeah. but, uh, and I'm starting to sound like a broken record. I, I just want results, man. I don't care if it's your backup quarterback. It's, it's been long enough. Get, get, yeah. I've been in this chair. I haven't seen success. Like what I consider success. I have not seen since being at this chair, not seen the success that I, I expect to have at AM. Yeah, and our to be honest, man, our fans deserve it. Uh we're like the the Buffalo Bills and the Detroit Lions right now. Every uh, Cleveland Brown, you throw them in there. Every Aggie is waiting. We're saying we got the facilities. We got the the fan base. We got the stadium. We've got the the workout field. We got the the indoor field. We've got everything that you could ever possibly need to be good. When when I go back to AM, i I'm looking around like, what is this world that we've created? We've, we've got everything that you could need, and these guys don't even understand what we had when we were playing there. It's, it's five times better, if not ten times better. And to your point, we've got to yield some type of results, and we're not doing that. Um, gosh, I think for the offense, I agree. I like that we aired it out some. Noah made some great catches. I hate that Moose isn't being utilized downfield the same way Noah is. But I'm thinking now, looking back on it, just outside looking in, I think it's more of Jimbo being a governor on Petrino. I don't. I think he has safety on still. He's not letting Petrino do his thing. I, I think back, rest in peace to Ryan Mallett. I think back to those Arkansas days when Petrino was the coach. And I, I remember him airing it out. It was like, man, this guy has a green light just to get it down the field. And we're not doing that. We need to be, I don't know if we need to mix it up and go hurry up, but we have too many weapons to be as stagnant as we are on offense. I want to strike fear in defenses um, in the defensive coordinator's mind. And we're not doing that. These guys are just like, Oh, well, they're going to try to dink and dunk us. Let's just pressure and we'll be fine. So we got to figure it out. Jamie, I, I don't know how, when you watch games, if you're, if you're watching it through a tight end lens as a receiver, or maybe even a little bit of the blocking, but like nothing's going to get done if they don't block. Right. Like, so that, that is at, at, at the end of it, the root of the problem. Yeah. Max has made some issues. The plays are, aren't in some plays are there to be made. As you mentioned, what do you see from a blocking perspective? And I'm not putting it completely on the line. I'm talking about from a blocking perspective, tight ends, offensive linemen, running backs, picking up their blocks. What are you seeing? 
Um, I'm seeing teams dictate what we do. Uh, it's not like we have – There, there's times when you can max protect and you can slide everybody one way. It seems like we're going out there saying, okay, these guys have put on tape that they're doing this and we're not prepared for blitzes when they do arise or when they do come. Like I mentioned earlier, with the hot read or with the back just picking it up. Um, I mentioned it last week. I'm telling you. I think the fix would be going and getting Jim Turner. Every time he has been affiliated with our pro and I, I know just because he was a coach when I was there, and I know the, how he speaks, how he comes across, how he uh players buy into what he's he's talking about because it's all if you do what he says, is you're you're gonna be golden. And it, the proof is in the pudding with the draft picks that we've had every time that he's been in AM's tenure. Um I think it's just a scheme deal, and it, it's something's not relating with our current offensive line coach and what the defense is able to do to us and what they're we're, they're known on tape for doing. Um, it almost seems like it's a surprise that we're getting blitzed, and it shouldn't be. It's going to keep happening until we fix it. So this week in the bye week, granted, we've got some weaker opponents than what we face here recently, but – it doesn't matter. They're going to – it's a copycat league. They're going to look at what these teams did well against us and bring it back. So we've got to get in the lab, fix the problems. It's a bye week. This is a great time to do that. And then we're coming to – South or South Carolina's coming to us. It's a great opponent for, to, for us to try to get back on track. But, gosh, there's got to be more, and we expect more. And there, uh, we just uh, – this is this is broken, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> that is fine. <funny. laughs> how how much special teams did you play in your career, Jamie? At AM, I didn't do much. Um, NFL, that's if you if you're gonna stick around, you you got to be involved in special teams some way, some fashion. So with my little time that I had to do it in the NFL, I it took me back to man, I could have been so much better of a player and so much more. I could have had so much more contribution if I was doing it in college, but me being the starter for the two years I was at tight end, they just didn't have me out there, whether it be field goal or whatever the case. Yeah, I, I remember doing field goal and whatnot, but special teams is crucial, and you got to have dogs out there on special teams that are going to fly down and make the tackle, and then dogs that will go out there and make a block, whether it be Max Wright or whoever it is, but our kicker, our the, punter. All of it, that's right? That's your only job. Well, the, I, I'm saying all special teams, from yeah. giving up scores to punting to kicking, like the whole thing. Do we do we have a special teams coach? No. Uh, uh, that That's a problem right there. Yep. You have to have somebody devoted, and it has to be somebody's job. When there's a mistake, when there's – when something's not going right, you have to be able to say what happened there. So, who was accountable for this? And that 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 there therein lies your problem as well. How can you not have a special teams coach when special teams is at least 35 percent of the game? Talking to Jamie McCoy here on like Tech. that's an issue. Sorry, my fault. My fault. No, oh, no, no. You're good, Jamie. Um, priorities. If you could list the things you'd be working on this bye week, like. Give me a one, a two, and a three. Like the three things you would absolutely address. There's a lot to fix, but if you could fix three areas just to see, I don't even know, significant improvement, slight improvement, what would they be and how how, how should they go about it? I would say pass protection. Um, figuring out how we're going to slide the line. Who's responsible for what? Worst case scenario, if they bring more guys than we can block, what are we going to do? Who's hot? We've got to get a game plan for that and and everybody be on the same page. I would say that would be one. Two for me would be our run scheme. What type of team are we going to be? Are we going to try to zone this thing? Are we going to counter? Are we going to do power? What type of run team are we going to be in? Are we going to commit to that run? Um, it seems like we we get knocked off two or three runs and we kind of go away from that. So I like to see us commit to the run some fashion. And then back to special teams, I would say shoring up, shoring up the punting. Like that the punting just that that can't be an issue for a team. That's your only job. The the one punt that the punt return, they didn't bring pressure to us, and we still got a bad punt and didn't have good coverage. So 
coverage, lanes, and all of that, I think that's a, a big deal for us. And just a quick tidbit, um, I love DeBerry, the move they made with him to safety. I think that's good coaching. He shouldn't be out there on an island as a corner. I think him moving inside, he was I, – I feel like he was all over the field making plays, whether it be tackles, pass breakups, whatever the case may be. I think that was a good coaching move. So – it was out of necessity, but he did he did look good. Jamie, yeah. you said you're broken. Well, if you could look into the crystal ball, like, I mean, what do you see? What what? How fixable, not how fixable, but is it going to be fixed enough to make this season something, it's not going to be memorable in the way that we, well, maybe if you think nine wins is memorable, but like, well, what do you think can be made of the season is the long-winded way of asking this. Mm. Optimus Jamie would say, oh, we're going to win out, as I did last week, and we didn't. <laughs> um, what, I, what I would like to see is us come out of the bye week, play South Carolina. It shouldn't even be a struggle. The game should be over at the half. We should have a backup coming in. Whoever's going to be backing up Max Johnson, he should be getting some reps and just getting his fillers out there for a worst case scenario. If we were, were to ever lose him, we don't want his first snap to be in third quarter against Ole Miss. So getting younger players, more experience. I think that uh, I like to see that um, in an ideal world, LSU is going to take care of itself. That's the last game. We know Abilene Christian is going to be what it is. And Mississippi state isn't that well. Our next quality opponent that's ranked that would be another road test to break our curse or whatever this thing is that we can't seem to get taken care of will be Ole Miss. I don't like Kiffin. I don't think Jimbo likes Kiffin. I think our whole fan base doesn't like Kiffin. I, I, I think it's just a war with Ole Miss. That is your next opportunity. That should be our Super Bowl, for lack of a better word. That should be our, our chance to say, hey, we heard the criticism. We know we've been bad this year, but we're going to go out here and put this on tape and let this be what you guys judge us by moving forward. If we can handle Ole Miss and handle the rest of uh, – Jimbo's never had a, done a bad job with teams that we're supposed to beat, I don't feel like. I feel like games we're supposed to win, we win those. So if we can handle Ole Miss, that would be a plus in my eyes. So where things stand right now today – Today, not what we expected, not what we want, you know, not what we deserve. Would you be happy with eight and four as things are today? You haven't won on the road and since Lincoln was president, so just remember that. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be happy, but I would be okay with it. Um, starting the year. That's that's one of our deals at this Monday lunch. Everybody predicts the bad, everybody's schedule, how it turns out. And everybody's, oh, y'all are gonna go eight and four. And I'm not 10 and two, or you know, I'm I'm always optimistic with the Aggies. But where we sit right now, four and three, eight and four would be okay. It would be um expected on people that aren't Aggies, but it would be okay. Nine and three would be fabulous. And what about seven and five? Oh, seven and five, we need to make some changes somewhere. Okay. And I already, I, I've mentioned, I would love to have Jim Turner back in back in our fold. Um, great things happen when he's involved with the program and offensive line just has never been an issue. I hate seeing Max struggle, backpedaling, making throws. I hate seeing that. I want us be to be dominating and moving these guys forward. So. Maybe that change if it's a seven to five, or we definitely need a special teams coach. We there's got to be emphasis on special teams. It's a big part of the game. Jamie, thanks so much for your time, brother. No problem. Thank you, David. Giggle, giggle, brother. Uh, Jamie McCoy here on the hotline. Appreciate his time. Now right, let's hit a break. We'll come back with Jamie Morrison. It's the dueling Jamies here on the program. Uh, the volleyball team has won four straight games. Looking forward to catching up with him. Right now, if your organization or business is looking for opportunities to engage with Aggies, then check out the Association of Former Students. The association brings Aggies of all ages during all their cool events. 
throughout the year. Marquee events such as Aggie Ring Day, All Aggie Hullabaloo, and Gathering welcome tens of thousands of guests out there. And there are many sponsorship and vendor opportunities available to get your brand in front of all those attendees. All events offer a wide variety of both digital and in-person options to promote your brand. Options include title sponsorship naming, on-site presence, activation, recognition in social media posts, and much, much more. There's also uh, advertising opportunities in both the Texas Aggie Magazine and the Aggie News Newsletter, which are seen by over 230,000 people. If your business is ready to engage, choose a partner with the organization that's been supporting the Aggie Network for over 140 years. For more information on options available through the association, please email sponsorships at aggienetwork.com. It's the Association of Former Students. I think I got Jamie Morrison to say he's going to start jujitsu in the offseason. I think that's what we were talking <laughs> you about. You need a hobby. I'm in. I'm in. You can come beat me up every once in a while. Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, hello. Four straight wins. I love it. Yeah, yeah. How you feeling? I uh, feel good. Uh, we take it one at a time. So, like, I was doing some media stuff yesterday. They were asking me about, like, three games ago. And I'm like, who did we play three games ago? Um, 
but yeah, I, uh, I think we're finding different ways to win in every single one of these games. Uh, we can block. I know that. Uh, and excited about what's coming. I think we got a really, really good test coming out in the second half of the SEC. So uh, excited to see how good we are. I'll brag about you on air because I made a comment to you that was the fifth that you heard or fourth that you heard today. I was like, thank you for being on campus. We need something to be excited about. It has been cool to see like people who I know aren't volleyball people be aware and into what you're doing. Yeah, no, and it's appreciated. And I think our crowds are growing every single game. And uh, and I, don't know, I, I was sitting down and doing a podcast with Joni yesterday, and we were just talking about how special the 12th man is, how special of a place. And we were being thanked for embracing this. And I'm like, thank you for embracing us right. uh, and my staff and me and this team. And uh, we're doing something special. Uh, I want people to come watch um, and excited to be here. Yeah, and when you mention thinking about the next game and one game, it sounds easier than said than done, but like there's outside noise. How how do you keep players completely? Because I'm sure for you, you're focused on that game. But how do you keep players focused on the next game? By the way, Florida. Yeah, uh, I think it's actually focused on the next practice. Okay. Like, uh, and I think we do things a little differently. Where like our practices aren't geared towards like we're playing Florida on Friday. Our practice today will not be geared on beating Florida. Our practice today will be geared on making us the best volleyball team that we can be. Uh, and I think even the way we scout, it's basically like, hey, here's the small things we need to adjust, but go play like us. Uh, so I think it just it shines through the entire season a little bit of like, hey, it's not about Florida. It's about us and developing us into the best. Is that know. like fundamentals or is it just? Uh, uh, all of the above. Like yeah. it'll be fundamentals today. Uh, again, dialing on the way we pass, like making sure we're, we've been trying to make one change for two weeks. Of like, hey, and then I told the girls until we get to 80% on this, we're not going to move on to the next change. Uh, so I think when it's dialed in on you and becoming the best version of yourself so that you can go off and beat Florida and then beat Georgia. Again, I'm one at a time right now. I had to put some thought in there on Sunday. Uh, then all of a sudden it kind of permeates throughout the entire season. Where And we were talking before this about uh, it's a lot of the same athletes that were here last year. But I was like, no, but they're different. Uh, they made a lot of change during the spring and put in the work to become a different version of themselves. And we do that every single day of practice so that, again, we can go out on Florida and hopefully be better than the last time we played Florida. Uh, and that's our goal every day. Getting back to that 80% number, how important is the repetition? Because there's one thing to do it and do it a couple times, yeah. but like constantly practicing at that level then makes it just normal when game day comes. Yeah, and I think... There's a piece of it, and I'll go on a little tangent here. Uh, like the way we practice is also a little bit different in that we want to add some variability to what we're doing. So it might be, hey, we're trying to make this change, but we might try to make it in 10 different ways. So it might be we're going to try to make this change and pass perfectly, or it might be we're going to try to make this change and pass backwards. Uh, so we try to make it so that uh, the brain's having to work every single day is a piece of it. Um, and then going back to the other piece, yeah, like uh, I think one of the biggest things you'll hear out of me is be you. Mm -hmm. uh, and make you the best version of you. But our goal in practice is to change ourselves a little bit so that I'm a different volleyball player. And when I go out and I play Florida on Friday, I'm not trying to fake it. I'm not trying to like, I don't know, have this motor pattern, this way that I pass that is, I don't know, something different than what I am. And when we go out and compete, it's just go be yourself. It's go be free to be yourself, express yourself, play the game the way that you play it, not the way that necessarily I want you to play it right now, but in that moment, be yourself and go compete. I wonder how hard that is because, like, I'm thinking football here. Like, you're told to do a thing a certain way, right? And you're doing it and you're doing it. But on game day, you really do need to simplify it and hope some of that stuck. But also, what is that athlete going to have to do to play yeah. with that confidence that you need? Am I allowed to, like, quote another podcast on a podcast? Let's I guess go. this isn't a podcast, it's a radio show. Uh, one of the biggest things that changed my coaching career was uh, I was actually listening to this podcast on the way and not the, not the episode of this, but um, Michael Gervais was our sports psychologist during the 2016 Olympics. And he has a podcast called Finding Mastery. Uh, and he talks to high performers just about their craft. He, sometimes he talks about experts in their field about high performance. And uh, I don't remember her name, but he had a snowboarder on. And he always asked the question, how do you define mastery? Uh, and she said, uh, mastery is mastering the fundamentals of your craft so that you can express who you are through what you do. And for me, I was like, oh, man, that's deep. That is deep. Like, yeah, and I just started thinking about it more and more. And again, it changed the way that we scout, changed the way that we do a bunch of things. But um, at the end of the day, like especially snowboarding, I'm an extreme sports guru. Like, like I grew up skateboarding. I grew up inline skating. Uh, snowboarding is my favorite thing on the planet. And I was just thinking about snowboarding. Of like everyone can pull a trick. 
but everyone has their own flair that they add on to it, a grab or something that makes it unique to them. You look at Sean White, you're like, that's Sean White doing a 1080 inverted flip. Like, uh, and I was like, man, like, but they all have the fundamentals of being able to do that trick, but add their own flair to it. So the way that we coach is a little bit of like master the fundamentals, master these are the five things you have to do to be a good passer, but then go express yourself in a way. Like I want you to look different than her and I want you to look different than the people on the other side of the net because you are an individual. So uh, I think when it comes to systems, everyone has to, and another again podcast, I was listening to the same podcast, but another quote that I stole was be you through us of like there's an us that has to happen. Like we have to have a culture that this is Texas A&M volleyball. We have to have a system that this is what we're going to run. But everyone has space to be an individual within that. Uh, but these are the non-negotiables that it takes to be a part of this program, whether it be culture or whether it be like the way we do block. Like you have to do it. But our, our blockers are all good. They all fit to the system, but they all do it slightly different. I feel like you really embrace the psychology of sports oh, in your coaching. Yeah. No, uh it's interesting because uh, I have conversation with coaches and like one of the co questions that I always ask and go back and forth on is like, what, what do you, what can you not unsee now that you see it? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's just the integration of what our mind does and what our body does. And you can tell when people are starting to think about something else and like motor patterns are starting to change. But yeah, it's, uh, I would say it's 50% of the way I coach now. One of the things that you've mentioned several times and we're, we're seeing it play out, which is what I, why I like to bring it up is you're winning in different ways. Yeah. Um, the comeback over the weekend, like there's so many different ways your team wins. Just sure. kind of expound on that. Yeah, I, I think, again, the one of the BU through us, one of the us PCs that we talk about is being optimistic problem solvers. Uh, that regardless of the circumstances, we're not going to be like, hey, we're going to do it. It's going to be, hey, we're going to do it, and this is how we're going to try. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try this. And Say that, that again, optimistic what? Optimistic problem solvers. I'm writing that down. I like that. Uh, and I just think there's some people that are like, hey, we're going to be optimists. And then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, like, everything's going to be great. And I'm like, everything's not going to be great unless we figure out a way to get out of this. Um, so uh, I think that's been a really cool thing that I think when we've gotten down lately and before the beginning of the season, it wasn't the case. Like we would get down and it would be like everything would fall apart and we'd have to restart the next set. And now it's like every, we get down and we're like, hey, we'll find a way to do this. It might be Lauren coming in to serve like that comeback we had on Sunday. Uh, it might be, hey, we go get three stuffs in a row and all of a sudden we're right back in it. It might be, hey, we're going to get a touch and our offense is going to turn it. Um, but I think we've done a really good job of not, I don't know, panicking in that moment uh, and trying to find some way out of it. Sports is always a metaphor for life, but that <laughs> what you said right there to me like can be applied in oh, everything yeah. we do. Uh, at the end of the day, like, and I think obviously sports are a big deal, and uh, and yeah, like they're entertaining. We get one hundred eight thousand people at Kyle Field, like we get thousands of people at our volleyball matches, and we talk about putting on a show for those people. But at the end of the day, our job as coaches is to develop people for life through sport. Uh, and this is temporary for these athletes. It's four years. And I think sometimes it's like there's so much attention put on this that like people don't realize that, that this is a blip on the radar for these yeah. people, these humans that are coming through our programs. And it's our responsibility as coaches to make sure they leave our program ready for the next 60 years of their life. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, like it's, I don't know, it's a metaphor for life. It's a metaphor for business. Like, uh, everything that we do in this is basically preparing for people for what's coming next. Last thing for you, you're only as good as your last game. Um, and I know Florida was a huge win, yep. but it means something, but it needs to mean something on Friday. Is yeah. it Friday? I think it's Friday, right? Friday. Yeah. Friday. Talk about them coming here to read and, and what you need to see from your your group. Yeah, I think what I said earlier, like the biggest thing I want to see is us be a better version of ourselves than we were the last time we played them. Uh, and win or lose, like uh, that's what you're looking for. And uh, it's hard, especially as a head coach, like the only, I don't know, feedback that you get now is maybe a little bit from your student administration of like you're doing a good job, but like you, I, we were talking outside about like, I can't imagine coaching soccer where you tie and you're like, I'm not sure how to feel about myself right now. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not having any judgment. And I think one of the hardest things as a head coach is again, you don't get that feedback. So you win, you're like, we're doing a great job. And you lose, you're like, oh man, like I'm horrible. Uh, so really I try to take a step back and be like, hey, win or lose. like were we better this time than the last time we played, especially as you're playing a team twice. So uh, I want to see us be better. Uh, I want to see us, uh, I'm hoping we get a crowd there. I want to see us play an entertaining brand of volleyball. Uh, I want to see us be optimistic problem solvers. And if we get down, make sure that we're trying to find a way out of it. And if we do all of those things, like I'm happy win or lose.
Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. All right, right now we need uh, caller number one. We're going to give you a free car wash right now from Aggieland Express Car Wash in South College Station off of William D. Fitch in Greens Prairie. They're Aggie owned and operated with the friendliest staff and a personal touch. They offer a monthly membership, but we're going to give the first caller right now a free car wash from Aggieland Express in South College Station, 979-693-1150. Welcome back in Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I got my KBTX friends in the house, Tyler, Morgan, Nicole, and you are really worried about me. I this am. Is twice you've asked me like <laughs> yes. I'm doing. Because I was listening, you know. Um, she listens to you. Val, uh, what is it called? Um, long time listener. Or? First time, long time. Yes, long time. So this morning I had to. I went and got a coffee, and I was sitting in my car, and I heard you were like, you know, when my team loses. I don't. I I'm don't out. watch any sports. I'm out. He's like, I didn't watch the Astros Rangers game, so I'm out. Yeah, I'm out. I don't want to be reminded. Look, I have to do this for 15 hours minimum of the week, and I have to be on top of this beat. But everything else puts me in a bad mood because I go back to those dark places. So yeah, the I'm Texans out. Texans won. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, like I'm flying back, and I'm still sad about what happened in the yeah. Tennessee game. Like, I don't know. I the only thing I can do is I can watch combat sports, and then. 
everything else, I'm out. Like I don't, I, don't, I keep up because I have to, right? Like, I gotta watch highlights of these games, but I don't want to be invested in three hours of something that's just gonna make me think about. That's just me. That's how I roll. I mean, that, that's what sports like does to people, though. You know? Yeah. You have to it's, emotionally detach. Look, I know I'm a journalist, but this is my school. Like, mm -hmm. why'd I say it with a? This is my school. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying yo. Uh, anyway, let's all kind of talk about where we are with this program right now, where this program is going. I'll have you start, Tyler. All right, so the weird thing is, record-wise, this is exactly where I thought they would be at this point. I, okay. but before the season, well, actually, no, I, I take that Miami. back. Miami. Yeah, Miami. <laughs> take out Miami. So I, I thought they would have two losses because I, I figured Alabama was a loss and that Tennessee was going to be tough. That's a loss. My, yeah, and then the Miami won, I guess, throw things off a little bit. But uh, I definitely feel worse rather than just what the record indicates. But it's, it's the way they lost those two games that kind of – throw some red flags you know I mean they, they they've shown they have the talent they have the players to do it uh, they were leading at halftime in both of these games they got outscored 29 to 6 in the second half between Alabama and Tennessee so it's just um, it's a little demoralizing you know when you, you think of what could have been and it keeps happening I think it's also demoralizing because it's the copy and paste effect of yeah. 2022 and part of 2021. Morgan? Um, I kind of feel a little bit similar to Tyler, like record-wise. I think they should have won the Alabama game, but three losses isn't the end of the world. I think they can still do well this season if they use this bye week to kind of turn it around. It is What is well? Well. What, what is it like? What is, is it well? Nine, I mean, I think... Nine wins as yeah. well? Okay. I think if you want to keep fans invested, keep people invested in Jimbo Fisher, you got to win out. Well... Can you see a scenario where they went out when they haven't won on the road since you know when? Uh, since Lincoln was president? That's what I said, yeah. Yeah, I was like, that's not true. I was <laughs> that's, listening. That's not true. <laughs> I, I think it, Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. Abraham? I was like, yeah. Lincoln, um, I don't know. It's hard because you have the bye week, so you have some time to, you know, get healthy, maybe get some things figured out, make some tweaks, but... I, I don't know what the answer is. Like, what are all the tweaks that need to be made in order for you to win two games on the road when you haven't won in since 2021 on the road? So I'm going to ask you, what went wrong? What has gone wrong in your <sighs> eyes? Man, uh, well, it's the last two games, they'll march down the field on the opening drive, and you're just like, well, this is... This, this is, is easy. And then they get a touchdown or uh, they come away with, well, Alabama, they didn't come away with points, but marched it all the way down. And then this one was a, you know, Max Johnson diving end zone touchdown. You're like, all right, good energy. He's going to will this team. And then you look at the box score and each quarter it's seven, three, three, zero. And you're like, that's not, <laughs> that's not the way I wanted it to go. <laughs> and so it's just, I don't know what went wrong. I mean, you can look at special teams. You can look at offense. The defense is playing so well, but they're losing players now. Mm -hmm. um, players are going down, and it's just uh, I can't pinpoint one thing that was that was wrong. I can. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Morgan's got the answers. The offensive line, perhaps. Okay. I just think when you have an offensive line that is allowing your quarterback to get beat up every game, I think – the pressure rate was 64% against Tennessee. They had are leading the nation in allowing QB hits, which they also did last season. They're not able to create runs, and the short yard, yard rudge is not great either. They're creating these third and long situations that's putting pressure on Max, and then it makes him not look as good. So I think if the offensive line performed a little bit better, it could have been a different game. Tell to combine that with the fact that Max – has a propensity, that's a good word, right? Propensity. He holds like the ball a little long. A little long. Well, he's always back, sorry. Uh, he's always, like, every play, it's like, back, 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 throw. Or, like, he's no, fighting he's for back, his back, life. back, back. He's fighting for his uh, life out throw. there. Okay? He, he is. And, and and that's the thing, is he needs a line to protect him better. And, you know, any quarterback could. Um, but I think the difference you see between him and what Connor is, Connor gets rid of that ball, you mm -hmm. know? And maybe he made up, for, well... Part of it is maybe Connor made up for some of the deficiencies on the offensive line. Part of it's the competition level, too, because Connor didn't even play a conference game this year. Uh, Max is playing against some some stellar defensive lines so far. Um, but, yeah, he's got to get rid of the ball, and it, it's just not happening. And the fact that, yeah, the offensive line's not giving him – and I don't think it's a personnel issue either. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about it. They've got some big bodies on the offensive line, some talented dudes. It's the, the guys with experience. Yeah, and, and experience too. You know, they just 
um, they need to gel. They need to, to play together schematically. Maybe there's something wrong. Yep. Morgan, if you could have one playback, what would that be? Mm. Mm. <laughs> there's so many. I know. Um, probably one of the interceptions. Uh -huh. I just think in a game where you're fighting like that and you're unable to put up points, you can't turn the ball over. So probably one, especially in the second half. Right. Because they're not a second half team, really, or at least they've proven that. So you, you can't do that. I would kind of agree that second one, that second interception, because I started to have a flashback with how bad that game had gone. They were still in a position to, to win it. They had the ball at the end of the fourth quarter. And I was at that game at LSU two years ago when A&M had a lead and Max Johnson was the quarterback and he led them on a pretty much flawless two minute drive down the field to win. And I, in my head, I just, you know, this is going to be Max Johnson's time. Here it is. Here he is again. He's going to, you know, after all this, this, you know, terrible game has gone so far, these last two minutes are just going to be this perfect execution and, and they're going to send this thing to overtime. But you know, that doesn't happen when you can't protect the quarterback play you'd like to have back? I would go with the special teams touchdown. Oh, that that was terrible. So, <laughs> Especially since well, the defense crazy. only gave up seven points, right? Yeah. So, or one touchdown, I should say. Because you've got Constantino punting from the back of the end zone. I mean, I don't think he could go any farther back. And then um, was a 45-yard punt, 50-yard punt with the end zone, and then um, he just – I think I – I think I like looked down because I was typing the highlights. The and commentators then, or, were really like, he wants to get the ball, yes. and then he got it. And, and just, then I looked up, and I was like, oh, well, then <laughs> delete that. <laughs> <laughs> Rewrite this highlight. So I want that playback just because it's a one-score game. The The end of the game ended up being that, and um, I feel like that was just the moment. Like I feel like with the, this team right now, they're playing, they're playing not to lose, and like as soon as they lose the lead – you don't see them fighting back because they're not putting up points. So how shocking is that, guys? Like they're not putting up points. An offense that we saw earlier this season put up and, so many and, points, and, and uh, they invested the time and effort. And they have the studs. They have a quarterback that is proved. Like Max is still a sophomore. You've seen him. <laughs> <laughs> you've seen thirty-six year old yeah. sophomore. You've seen him do a two-minute drill at LSU to beat a and um, Obviously, the coach and the personnel, it's all different. But I just – what's – Anias, one reception for 20 yards? Noah was yeah. back. Noah had, like, a nice game, but no one has had over 100 yards rec receiving or on the ground in, what, two, three games? Well, SEC offense has been bad. It's been one-half games. It's mm -hmm. So – so when we look at the seven games this team has played, and I know you expected kind of this. Tyler's right. like, I predicted this. I was like, yep, uh, exactly. But, <laughs> but how, how shocking Five is it two, but yeah. that the, this team is four and three and the way they're four and three? How shocking mm -hmm. is it to, if I could have asked you this same question, like, I don't know, September 1st, hey, this is what they're going to be and this is the why. Would you have been shocked? I don't think I would have been shocked, but I think it's more so disappointing in which the manner they are losing. Mm -hmm. I just don't think they know how to win. I thought the what we saw, and I know you know New Mexico, and you know it's not the the same competition, but what we saw these first few games of the season, it looked like they were a different team than last year. Right. But the way they're playing right now, they look like they did last year, and I think that's the the shocking thing to me is I was convinced that they had kind of turned a corner and they were progressing and, and there's still time left maybe they have but for the time being they kind of look like last year all right let's do this let's hit a break we'll come back um and get some final thoughts here we'll do the big takeaways and i don't know we'll, <laughs> we'll find some optimism somewhere right it, it, it's tech sags radio presented by david gardner's jewelers
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is the uh, KBTX Roundtable. All right, friends, let's uh, do something we're actually happy with. All right, so <laughs> some therapy. It, so, what is a football? And we'll get into some other sports here in a minute. But what is a football thing you're happy with? I am happy with the front seven on defense still. Okay, good. I hope that Edrin <laughs> Cooper is okay, and yeah. I hope that Walter Nolan is okay as well. Absolutely, but that is what I am happy with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to kind of take that and narrow it down. I'm happy with the linebackers. Uh, you know, Edgerin Cooper is a stud, yes. and uh, Torian York has been a huge bright spot. A, a true freshman to play like that, you got to you know feel happy about where kind of that group is headed in the future. I like two good answers. I will be more specific. <laughs> I'll pick Edgerin Cooper. No, um, I'll go. I'll go Randy Bond on kickoffs. Because he had um, yeah, that's so three, specific. three touchbacks. So with the way special teams are going, you know, you need to make Don't sure give you, them can, them you, all. you You gave a compliment and a criticism in the same comment. That's what I do. <laughs> a little backhanded. Yeah. So let's do some um, big uh, takeaways, all right, from the KBTX. The, what do I call it? KBTX big, the big three takeaways. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Nicole, you start us off. So um, it was a one, only a one-score game, even though the score didn't feel like it. Compliment, backhand, sandwich. <laughs> um, they, these games that they're playing in Alabama, Tennessee, they can win them. Um, so I think that that's nice. At least it wasn't a blowout. Okay. You're so optimistic. I'm trying to be optimistic here. So, so did you hear my stat earlier in the show? W- what time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The stat is they were 4-8 and eight in one-score games oh, yes. since 2021. Mm-hmm. But would you rather lose a one-score game or lose by 30? Uh, honestly, maybe by 30, the way this is going, because then I know I can check out, <laughs> okay. emotionally check out. Like it's it's like a slow death. Okay, this is a this is a slow death or a blowout would this be a slow, slow, slow death. death. No, a blowout would be like you're done, it's oh. over, right? Uh, you're not coming back from 34, except you're mm. if you, UCLA. Anyway, go ahead. And then, um, then other takeaway is how have they not um, ha- reached? How did they not reach the end zone outside of the first drive of the game? Mm-hmm. And then the third takeaway is that the volleyball team is playing really well. <laughs> yes. We're team Jamie Morrison here, aren't we? We are. Yeah. I talked to him like way back in February. I was like, we should meet the volleyball coach. And everyone's like, it's February. <laughs> well, but they're doing well. I know people were concerned. You know, he doesn't have head coaching, collegiate head coaching experience. But um, I really enjoy college volleyball. And um, it's been fun to see. They've already matched last year's win total. And um one at, uh, one at LSU and one at Florida. So. Yeah, it's Florida big. again on Friday. Yeah. It's a big one. Th- three takeaways. Um, you need to protect your quarterback. Yes, please. I love when please they do that. Please protect your that. quarterback. It's so nice when they do that. Um, <laughs> uh, you need to stay healthy. I think the bye <clears throat> week is coming at a really great time to hopefully get some players healthy again. Hopefully mm-hmm. nothing was season ending on the field on Saturday. Right. Um, and then also bye week at a good time. And then the men's basketball team. Coming in at number 15 preseason rankings. We'd we love, love to that. see that. Yeah. So, Looking yeah. forward to basketball. Basketball season. Basketball season already starting here on Tech Act <laughs> Radio. Tom? Um, I, as well as the defense has played, and they have played well, and there's no fault, I thought that Tennessee kind of won that battle between you had the best rushing team in the SEC, as far as the numbers say, and the best rush defense, and Tennessee kind of had their, their will running the ball. Yep. I thought. So that, that was one takeaway. Uh, two is as bad as the offensive line has been. Max does need to need to get rid of the the ball a little bit more. And then three is where where are the studs? We have to feed them. Yes. You know we, we must. They are like, hungry. You know, like we're like, starving the studs. We, we love that soundbite when we got it, and now it's like it's almost like a joke. Like it's a yeah. punchline, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, friends, thank you so much for coming in. Appreciate yeah, thank you. you guys. Thank you. When we come back, we're gonna keep it real with Jordan Pugh here on Texags Radio. That and hour number three next on Texags.
Time to keep it real here on Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We're here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the hotline. Jordan Pugh always keeps it real. Aggie, great joining us here. Jordan, good morning, buddy. What's going on? How you doing? Eh, you know, are we talking about in life or in football? Hey, man, a little bit of both. You know what I mean? They coincide with each other. They interconnect. You know what I mean? Hey, man, I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed to talk about the university that I love. So even though my football yeah. team is yeah. uh, is struggling a little bit, I'm I'm good, man. So I yeah. know you have you're very opinionated, right? Um, yep. And, and yep. this year, I feel you were more on the optimistic side than I've seen in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. After what happened at Tennessee, where are you? You know, I'm in that weird uh, purgatory space right now. Okay. Okay, that's where I'm at. Um, when I look at uh, just the state of where we are, is I think it's interesting. Okay. Uh, going into the season, man, I thought this was, was a year that we could really take advantage of, of everything that we've been trying to build, right? Top recruiting classes, young guys that got forced to play last year. Um, you, you saw strides being made throughout the season. Um, you know, we had our quarterback, I thought, of the future with Connor before he got hurt. Everything was in play. And then you look at what the defense has been doing all year long, how well they've been playing. You look at the the, the amount of uh, pressures, sacks, all that stuff that we're getting. You know, we do have a weakness in the secondary, but overall the defense has played, has played well. Just in general, the, the, the sense that I feel is, man, we have everything that we need, and we are not taking advantage of any of it. That's what I. That's what I feel. And and now I think it's one of those deals where it's it's where do we go from here? Um, that's the question. I think it's more of the I don't know, and I think it's more of the fear of the unknown because you've done we, as an administration, you've done everything. You you have magnificent facilities. You, you can't provide any better opportunities as far as uh, educational purposes are concerned. You've brought in top-tier talent from across the nation. Uh, you've made yourself a, 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 a national presence uh, with athletes, with high school athletes across the nation. It's like, what else is there to do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so there's a disconnect somewhere. And I think um, overall, the problem that a lot of us are having is we don't truly know what that disconnect is. Is it the coach? Is it admin? Is it both? Is it is it is it uh you know work ethic? Is it scheme? Is it what is it? What is the what is the problem so we can go fix it? I think that's where a lot of us are. When you look at the game overall, I thought the defense played well. If you look at it, what was the final score? 20, 20, 13. Yep. Defense defense played well and defense really gave up, let's say 13 points. One touchdown. If you want to call it that. Yeah. Even they had a punt return. You had the interception uh, that got them down to like their fifteen or wherever it was close. Defense was put in a lot of situations where they had to they had to hold up and they had to get that ball back to the offense. The defense played well. The defense has not been the issue with the team. We've had secondary issues that have caused us problems, but overall the defense has kept us in games. Offensively, I don't know if I I felt this way uh, this weekend. I think that we haven't adjusted the offense to Max's skill set. Part of me feels that way. Watching Connor play, you could tell that Connor, would, especially as, as the games went on with him, he got into his groove. But you could tell that his offense was kind of built around him, built around his legs, built around his skill set. When I look at Max, I don't know why he's so hesitant throwing the ball or uh, with the ball in his hands. It seems like everything is just it's taking forever in order to uh, uh, all come together offensively. The offensive line has been getting whooped lately. Uh, you don't see a lot of the movement passes. We have all those all those weapons from the backfield to the to the guys on the outside. And you don't see us taking advantage of those weapons. It just seems like something's off. And I don't know what the answer to that is yet. And that's a problem because, Petrino, you were brought here to help fix that. And I think there, there's a disconnect going on as well. Also, you know, I, I know this is kind of bleeding into my facts too, but another thing, two weeks in a row you have uh, an opportunity to put points on the board going into halftime. You have an opportunity, uh, like they like to say in football, to put your foot on their throat. And we don't even try. Not only do we, we, we don't try, we have timeouts, so we have the ability to be able to manipulate the clock, and we don't utilize that. I don't know, man. Something just seems so, – something seems off. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, I don't like it. I don't know I don't know why we're not being aggressive. It's not like we don't have the people. We don't have the personnel in order to do that. 
something's just off with this team, man. And and I think that's what's bothering me more than anything is because we what what is the true problem? And what I can go back to is 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 Jimbo. Uh, we've made every we made every change. He's been the consistent factor uh, here. So I don't know what that is, man. <laughs> I don't know what that is, and that's just kind of where I, where I'm at with the team right now. Jordan, I agree and I disagree on halftime. Okay because I just didn't have any faith that they could move the ball. So, so but, Yes, that, but, that's true. But I agree that it is too conservative. It is too cautious yes. of an approach overall. In that situation, I'm like, man, you know, just get, go to halftime with the lead. <laughs> like, I, don't throw the ball. I always bring up Alabama last year because that's the easy one to go to. But, it, if I, but that, that's the problem. Why don't I believe in this offense that was supposed to feed the Thank studs? You. That's the problem. That's the, that's the point. And so when you're looking at it, so going into the, to the Alabama game, so this is what I said. I said if you, if you were to ask me athlete for athlete, where do we match up, I think we're superior in our skill set when it comes to them. If you ask me on the front from our defensive line against their offensive line, I think we're superior. And I think that it played out that way and it proved true. Uh, so you had an opportunity, man, to, to – to, to make a statement going in, right? You have the lead going in at halftime. Make your statement now, right? Um, when you look at the Tennessee game. Tennessee game, you know, you're going in uh, with the lead again, but you're on the road. You have an opportunity to take the air out of the stadium. You know, even if you don't get it, okay, let's say, you know, worst case scenario, man, we, you end up punting, worst case scenario, you know, you, you have turnovers, but there's enough time on the clock to where you can manipulate a drive, but also enough time to where you can run the clock out. You know what I mean? I just think that there has to be a point where you say, look, man, we're trying to win. We're not trying to play to lose. That's what I think. And we have the personnel in place in order to do that. That's the problem. Um, th that was my issue with that. I just think, man, sometimes, you know, you, you have to weigh the risk and reward, and sometimes you got to take the risk because you got to ignite something um, in the team, man. And I, and I think I heard a stat. And tell me if I'm wrong. Is it eight eight road games, eight straight road losses? Is that true? Yeah. Oh, it's true. Uh, it's Missouri 2021. I couldn't believe that when I heard that. Yeah. I, it, it blew my mind. I'm like, wait a minute, what? Eight, so so what that tells me, man, it, there, there's a lack of belief in something that Jimbo is feeling right now. Now, he's in the building every day. He's around those kids every day, so he knows what's going on. But that tells me is you're, you're lacking a belief in something. There's some, There's a disconnect going on somewhere. And I just didn't like that, man. I think that says a lot. I think that speaks to where where we are as a team right now. Um, hey, Jordan. But, but something's missing. Yep. Nick just told me in my ear that Missouri game, the last time they won, was two years ago yesterday. Wow. And 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 hold on. Wow. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this even better for you. They okay. gotta go, okay. they gotta go to Ole Miss. They gotta go to LSU. So mm. there's a world where it's almost three years before they win a road game. Wow. Well, when you put it in perspective like that, wow, that's shocking. I, so, so here's what, so let's put it like this. Let's put some hope back into the, to the discussion. Our defense has been doing, has been doing their job. Our defense has been playing well. Now they gave up too much in the run game. You're looking at 200 plus yards against Tennessee. Now that's a problem, but the number one job is to keep them from scoring. They did their job in that aspect, right? At the end of the day, this game is about points. I score more points than you. I win the game. It don't really matter how many yards I give up, all this other type stuff. So the defense is affecting the ball game. The problem is the offense is not complimenting the defense. That's the that's the issue. And you're asking our defense to be perfect every week. You're asking our defense to be perfect in an explosive uh, SEC with with wide spread offenses. There's too much. There's too many things that can happen that that can uh, prevent the defense from get, or keep the defense from preventing big plays. I just think offensively, man, uh, we got to be able to help in, in that sense. We got to be able to score more than 13 points. We got to be able to score more than what was it against Alabama? Seventeen, I think. Whatever it was, um, we're not explosive enough, and we have the explosive weapons on the outside. That's the problem. We have the Anaises of the world, the Mooses of the world, the Evans of the world, Noah Thomas. Like, what is the problem? And we have three uh, workhorses in the backfield. Man, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is right now, and and the problem is I don't know how you fix it either. I think that's the biggest issue I'm having is what what is the fix? What was the solve agent here? I don't know what that is right now. Talking to Jordan Pugh here on Tech Radio. I guess I'll ask you this, and I almost don't care, but how different <laughs> does this season look with Connor right now? Like, do they win these last two games? Yep. And, and when I say I don't care, I mean that, like, I just want results. 
like it, you keep losing quarterbacks, well then fix that problem. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. don't get your yep. quarterbacks hurt every two weeks. Yep. Uh, I think I think right now what, what's our current record? Four and three. What is it? Four, four and three. three. Yes, sir. I think we're sitting at six and what is it? Would it be six and one? I think we're sitting at six and one right now. Connor is a quarterback. I think that people underestimate his legs, uh, his athletic ability running the ball on the outside. I think we beat Alabama. I think he 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 uh, makes more anticipate uh, anticipatory throws from the quarterback position. I think what you saw from Tennessee uh, defensively, I think he he takes advantage of a lot of what they do. Um, there was a reason why he was named the starter. There was a reason why so many guys were pushing for him to be the starter because you saw something special in him. Um, if I, you know, I was running across the stats, uh, and I need you to confirm this. I don't even think uh, Max has passed him in total yards passing yet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and and uh, I want to say, and has. I want to say, yeah, if, if you can give me an answer on that, is that true? I'm looking at the numbers right now. I don't believe it's true. I mean, I believe you you are true. He's thrown for 898 yards, and Connor Wegman has thrown for. Here we go, 979. So you're telling me in two and a half games he threw for almost a thousand yards. So now let's take that and let's apply that to the to the, the three or four games that he could have been playing in. Man, you're talking about Heisman type numbers. He was already at a 98 percent QBR at the time uh, when he got hurt. I think that makes a big difference. I think from an offensive perspective that the that the that the scheme offensively has not adjusted to what Max does well. Now that's not letting Max off the hook. Max, for whatever reason, is like he's slow processing. He's hesitating too much. He's not letting that ball go. He has run lanes to throw to. The one, the one play that irritated the, the crap out of me was when uh, he dropped back the pass, and I don't know who stepped on his foot when he was getting ready to release the ball. He had a wide open run lane. If he gets it, he gets the first down. I think that's the difference between Max and Connor. I think Connor takes that run lane. Connor takes more. Uh, he takes control over the game more often, I think, than Max does. And I think you see a different outcome in these two games. But, yeah, man, I'm with you. I, You know, it's not more so how do you fix a problem. Just fix it so we can get these games won. Look, I uh, I recognize any team in the SEC with their backup quarterback is going to struggle. I yep. get it, right? That, that's Bamo goes to their guy. Tyler Buckner is going to look worse, way worse, right? I think yep. my my big problem is it's been the same story the last three years. You're on your backup quarterback, so stop getting him hurt. And why does it have to look like it looks just so slow and like so like it looks like 2022 again? Yeah. And it shouldn't just you should be able to have at least the flow, the creativity should still be fast, in my opinion, regardless of who's that quarterback. Yeah. Maybe they're not as effective, but it should at least look better. Well, it, it's schematic. Um, to me, that's a schematic issue. So it's, it's, it's twofold. If you have a backup quarterback, let's say you lose your starter, but you don't have the personnel on the outside, say the personnel on the backfield, you don't have the weapons to be able to, to distribute the ball, you're going to see a lot more struggles. The difference is, is you have the weapons here where you can distribute the football. The problem with us is, is being able to get the ball into the, our weapons' hands. What I saw in the Tennessee game was I saw a lot of passes that were past the midpoint, meaning five yards or, uh, or more. There were a lot of passes that were – five, 10 yards of depth, 15 yards of depth, which allows more time to develop, which makes Max hold the ball more. When you saw Max succeed in the past game, it was a lot of quick rhythm uh, rhythm throws. It was a lot of high-low concepts. Routes at five yards, routes at 10 yards. My first yard at 10 is not open. I can check it down to the five-yard route, or I can send it out to the backfield. Uh, but there was also missed opportunities as well. I think there's a, there, I think 90% of it is scheme. It is a scheme element to this. I think that they reduce the amount, the, the scheme that they want to run in order uh, uh, by uh, really, they reduce the scheme that they want to run saying that we can't do what we really want to do with Max like we could with Connor. I think that they're telling you that, but also there's opportunities that Max can take advantage of that he's just not. For example, the wheel route that was wide open that mm -hmm. we missed. Like for the love of God, you got to hit that. That's where the player has to make the play. That, that Those are opportunities, man, where you can't miss those, especially on the road. So I think, you know, it's a combination of the two, but I think it's heavy scheme, 10% player. Why uh, – and look, I, we've, we've already said that the defense was good, right? Good enough yep. to win the game. Yep. But why do you think Tennessee – I mean, they're very talented, but why were they able to run the ball so effectively when others who tried – Three-man front. Three-man front. Okay. Three-man front. That's all it was. Uh, Tennessee is a better running team. Tennessee is a run-first team. They just do it out of a, a four-wide set. 
Um, the problem is, is I think they do a good job of scheming you in, in, in that sense because you have to be able to defend against uh, the pass. You know how great they are in the pass game. You know what type of scheme they run in the pass game. So you got to be able to defend. So I understand why, the why in that. But also at the same time, and you got to be able to have some type of level of trust. But that goes back to the deficiencies we've had in the uh, defensive backfield. I know you asked me last week, what is it, what's the fix um, in, in the in the DB room? And I think you saw it uh, this week. I think you saw with a lot of our three-man front putting a lot more athletes uh, on the football field, man. And, and it paid a dividend a little bit in the past game because uh, I think Milton only threw for 100 yards, if that. So you saw that fix. But now you, you it's, it's, it's like pick your poison. Which one? At the end of the day, the defense did their job. They affected the quarterback. And – uh, what is it? Gave up seven, ten points total. You did your job. The the name of the game is to not give up more points than my offense scores. That's the name of the game. You know what I mean? And I think they put our offense in position to be able to win this game, but we just didn't. We didn't do. We didn't do it as a complete team, and that was the issue this weekend. So I'm looking at the defensive fronts. Um, they in the it looks like early on they did much more four man. Um, as the game went on. It became more. Well, they, they disguised it in four man. So what they did was they lined them. They, they mugged the backers a lot. So you saw a lot of a gap, uh, a lot of a gap alignments from um, from Cooper, uh, York, those type guys. You saw a lot of guys line up uh, kind of like over fronts where you had the DBs walk down on the outside. So it was a lot of disguising. But what you saw in that was you saw a lot of drops. So they would disguise. They would drop two. They would just, they would disguise and drop one and try and create. Uh, uh, multiple fronts, or excuse me, multiple pressures with guys. But at the end of the day, what you saw with Tennessee was you saw a lot of traps. You saw a lot of counter plays to where they were able to manipulate what we were doing once they figured out uh, uh, our tendency on defense. So we were primarily a three-man front in the disguise of a four and five man. That's what you saw. Um, and they took advantage of that. So, you know, at the end of the day, the defense did what they needed to do. They created turnovers. Uh, um, they got off the field when they, when need be. We, we had the sacks again it's just we didn't do it as a complete team and the offense let us down in this uh in this sense all right bye week host south carolina you go to ole miss you host mississippi state you host acu and you go on the road to baton rouge where you haven't won since what 93 so don't do it give don't me your, it. give me a realistic view man what, what is this like what can this team be like can that's they be the problem i knew you're gonna ask i knew you i knew yeah. you're gonna do it you I can't ask do it. that you can't do it Okay. You can't do it because the team, they can win every single game. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. So you're asking me to be realistic. Well, realistically, they can beat every single one of them. That's the problem. The problem with, I mean, I don't know. Uh, see that. So, okay. So, let me see how I can answer the question. Let, let, me, let me phrase it like this. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Would you be happy today? Okay. Not not August first today. If this team is eight okay. and four at the end of the year, that means no. you split on the road. Be, no, no, I wouldn't be happy. Would you be okay? I wouldn't be happy. Content because that means what what that means is we've lost. I guarantee you, we lost to a, to a Mississippi school. If no, no, that's no. The case. You you could miss. You could lose to uh, LSU or you could lose to Ole Miss. One of those. You have to split those. On the no, road. I wouldn't be happy. Okay. I wouldn't be I wouldn't I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be happy because this this is what what year is this for Jimbo? Seven, whatever it is, year it doesn't even matter at this point. Uh year seven. You you stacked you have stacked the talent. You have made the cha- the the changes to the to the scheme. Uh you have the players, you have the horses, you you're seeing the benefits of it, but it's not all not coming together. I would not be happy. Ten wins to me was the minimum, and I'm not changing on that. You know what I mean? Now you can still get ten wins through a bowl win. You can, I mean, that's possible. But um, just overall, I think that would just be average, and that would be us accepting mediocrity again. That's what that would mean to me. I don't think the fan base needs to accept mediocrity because we don't operate in mediocrity. Meaning, how we put facilities together, the type of talent that we have. There's nothing mediocre about it. So to me, that would be a letdown. That would be a letdown if that happens. So you ask me today. If we finish eight four. I have an issue with that. Okay. Um, 
So, but your issue is more, if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, overall this team should be above that. But considering they haven't won on the road, remember, okay. it's so long. Let me ask you a question. Let yep. me can I ask you a question? Oh, come on. Let me ask you a question. If if you put, uh, let's just throw the name. If you put Kirby Smart in A and M uh, apparel, and he's the head coach of this team, what does this team do? They're better. Why? Well, he right now is. A f- <laughs> I got to be careful how I phrase this. But the bottom line is, no, he's right now a better say coach. It, say it. He's a better say coach it. right now. Okay. Okay. If you take, if you take, uh, who would be another one? If you take, uh, let's let's throw Brian Kelly in there. Okay. You know what? You know what? No, scratch that. If you take Eli Drinkwitz and you put him. Uh, with A and M, what do you what do you believe about A and M? I believe that the offense would be better and the defense would not be better. So what that what that statement just told me is he's at Missouri working with less, and Missouri is producing work, working with less, less uh, less state of art facilities, less talent within the state or without within the region, um, and he's out here winning games that he's not supposed to win. I'll give you one more. But Jordan, what let me, let me you ask you this. Mar- let me ask you this. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Because. It feels like this is the same story since RC. Like, whatever coach you put in here, yes. you're getting these. So, is it the coach, yes. or is it something bigger? That, that's the question. That's what I think is driving people crazy. Because you, you got a guy who has the national championship on his resume. You got a guy who is recruiting his butt off. You know what I mean? You have all of that. What is the problem? But when I look at it, I'm watching guys like Mark Stoops at Kentucky. Kentucky is going to give you hell every time you play Kentucky. He is working with less, and they are producing, man. They, they, they're they going undefeated. They may lose some chippy games here and there, but you know what they are. It, I don't know if this is an identity issue with us. Um, I don't know if it could be an administrative issue with us. I don't know what it is, but, man, everything is there. If you, if, for example, if this job opens up, it is literally turnkey. If I'm a coach looking at this, if I'm a coach looking at all the talent that's sitting there, I'm like, you mean to tell me I can't win with that? I just think, I just think that we're doing a whole lot. We're doing a whole lot of nothing with everything at our disposal. And I don't think we're taking full advantage. And there, there is, there is a major, major disconnect. Part of me believes that that's contract too. You give me a hundred million dollars. And we're average, there were this and that. I don't care. Human nature lets me relax because I'm secure. That's just the matter. That's the truth. That's a matter of fact. Sometimes I think you need those guys that have something to prove, but also who built something from nothing. There's something about those guys who have had to work with less that know how to utilize talent, but know how to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That really knows how to use it uh, because they've had to work with, with less, man. I just think. That there's a disconnect going on, man, because it's the same story every year. And and if we keep being delusional and acting like this is not a problem, man, we're going to keep getting the same result. The question is, we have got to identify that. It's got to be some hard conversations, man, but we got to identify what that is. And then we got to find a way to fix that and put in, put in a plan to fix that. Jordan, we're way past the break, man. Always great stuff. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. See you. See you next week. Jordan Pugh here on Tex Ags Radio. Let's hit a break. Come back with a short open segment uh, before we talk to Jonathan Hutton of Outkick the Coverage. Right now we're talking about the future of joint pain relief. It is here. It is advanced regenerative medicine. And I actually talked to my mom yesterday like on the phone. I was like, hey, have you called QC Kinetics yet? I'm a heath. Oh, no, I forgot to call. Well, you need to call, mom. QC Kinetics, I mean, get a different opinion, right? Like if you, you've had back pain for years and they've been telling you, let's give you a steroid shot, you know, let's uh, give you surgery. And they, that's what they continue to tell you. You owe it to yourself to get a different opinion about regenerative medicine. It is the it is not your only option to get the steroids, to get the surgery, right? That it, it uses your body's own healing agents to attack the joint pain, and I'm talking about lasting relief. These treatments go to the very root of the problem using concentrated healing properties directly into your joint to repair and uh, restore that damaged tissue. So imagine, you know, here as you're entering you know, the winter season, like going back and playing flag football with your family. I don't care if you're 80. Go do it. Feel good about it, right? Go get yourself feeling good once again with no drugs, no downtime. It's about living in motion, and QC Kinetics is giving people back their lives with an all-natural treatment. 
Call the local medical professionals and get a free consultation today. QC Kinetics, the nation's leader in regenerative medicine, 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That is 979-452-6000. Open segment time, Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. So during the show, before the show, actually, uh, I was talking to Luke. We were just talking about, like, look, things suck from a football perspective, but we've got some pretty darn good things happening on campus. So Luke did a little bit of research, and by research, he just used Google for a second. And uh, Luke, what you you got some things, at least for us as a university, to be happy about. Yeah, absolutely. So Jamie Morrison's volleyball team. First of all, we love Jamie Morrison here at Tech Sags. He inspired Thank you for me speaking for the group. Oh, of course. <laughs> he inspired me to do a little bit of research of coaches having success over the last couple of years at AM. So I'm gonna start with him. In twenty twenty two, A and M volleyball was five and thirteen in conference. This year they're six and two. So they've already eclipsed their conference win total and they've eclipsed their season win total. Last year they won thirteen. This year they have 14 and they have 10 games left. So there's a lot to work with on that. A lot to work with. And then over at women's golf, Coach Chadwell, back-to-back ties for third at the national championships in 2022 and in 2023. And then last year they also won the SEC championship on that 
I believe it was a dramatic last putt yep. playoff. That was electric. And then women's tennis, Coach Weaver. This is this is pretty insane here. So they have not lost a regular season SEC match in over two years. And then last year they had 30 wins and 10 of them were against ranked teams. They've made it to the NCAA quarterfinals twice in a row. And then before that, they made it to the round of 16 twice. And they've also been back-to-back SEC regular season champs and then tournament champs in 2022. And we've got Jim Schlossnagel. OB was a little bit skeptical on this because we he said we couldn't include his TCU success, but I'm going to anyways. In the last four years, Schloss has been to a regional in all four years. And then, of course, in his first year at a and he took us to the Final Four in Omaha. Pretty good. Yep. Pretty, pretty good. I don't know if I can consider TCU, but I think what you're speaking of is just the level of coach that yeah. we have across the street. And all you have to do is look at year one and how close year two was to being even bigger. Um, you know, just a game away from going back to the Super Regionals, and who knows what, have, what would have happened there. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Luke. Good, good Could I actually get one more in? Mm, hold on, let me think. Three, two. Yeah, go ahead. We'll have to give a shout out to Buzz Williams. Buzz! And- And the trajectory of this basketball team, back-to-back SEC championship appearances, and they have 56 wins over the last two years. They have not lost a conference game at home since February 8th, 2021. That is phenomenal. Plus, um, Joni Taylor deserves a lot of props for the the program she's building. Trisha Ford deserves props for the uh, program she's building. Coach Henry has obviously had so much success here. At Texas A&M, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but there's a lot. Corton, obviously, on the on the men's golf side, there's a lot of great uh, things happening here beyond what you may think of just football, which, hey, middle of the season, bye week, things good things can still happen. Let's hit a break here. We will uh, come back with uh, more here on Texas Radio. When we come back, we will speak with uh, Jonathan Hutton. I'll kick the coverage next on Texas
So while I enjoyed Chattanooga, it was all right. I would have rather have gone to Nashville. Uh, I just enjoy Nashville a lot. My buddy Jonathan Hutton from Outkick is out there. What's up, man? How you been? Nuno, I'm great, man. Uh, yeah, you're welcome back to Nashville anytime you want, man. Uh, red carpet rolls out for, for Tex Ags, that's for sure. And uh, anything you guys need, we're always here. And, and bring everybody. Let's go. Let's I've been to College it. Station. I need to open the, open the doors to Broadway. Well, l- let's do it. So, I don't know how you, you take in that game that we saw on Saturday because if you're a Tennessee fan, you're like, dude, if a and had a capable offense, we lose this game, and we lose it significantly. If you're a and it's like, here we go again. Same kind of deal. So just what was your big takeaway from, from Saturday? Well, being here in the, the mid-state, it, it, for me, it's just that we saw Josh Heupel and Tennessee win a game where they didn't have to score 30. Um, that's the first time I've seen Heupel do that as a head coach. That's number one. It was a uh, – I felt like the winner of that game, see if you agree, is, is a nine-win team. And the loser could be at seven. And, and this, for Tennessee, this season is representing, it's representing the floor, the base of what I think Josh Heupel is capable of as head coach. And, and my co-host, Chad Withrow, uh, coined that in the, in the preseason. And I, I agree with him now that we're here because Milton has been good, not great. He hasn't been bad but he hasn't really taken over the way Hooker did. And they're still finding ways to win some games. And case in point was this past Saturday. I don't know. Uh, you know, Clay has said that he felt like it was two programs passing in the night. I, I don't I don't know if that's the case yet. But it was a, a significant win, despite how that game played out for, for the Vols. And, and meanwhile, now you're looking at, what road trips to Ole Miss and correct me if I'm wrong, LSU. Yep. And it, it, that's a steep hill now. And and now because you didn't win that game Saturday, the Aggies are thinking, okay, what happens at the end of the year? Because it's not if you lose, it's how you lose in many cases. And uh, coming into a season where there's a lot of pressure and uh, a lot of money for a buyout, I I would have said, no, they're not. Jimbo staying. And I don't know where you come down on that, but there's still a lot of football to be played to determine that. And again, it goes back to it's not if you lose, it's how you lose. And losing on the road is not a great sign, especially from that game in Knoxville. Losing on the road. It's been two years since you've won on the road. You've got to go to Ole Miss where Lane Kiffin right now has your number. You haven't won in Baton Rouge since 1994. Like there's, there's it. And it's exactly what you just said. There's how you lose. And the way this team loses is they find different ways to lose. Special teams, yeah. like offense scores three points in three straight second halves. Like it's just, and everything you thought about this offense that you saw early. Look, I know there's going to be a, a drop off from Connor to the next guy. And I think Max is a good quarterback, but it shouldn't be that steep of a drop off. Especially for a guy with experience, you know? Like I, I was in Tuscaloosa when Max Johnson. Well, this was two years ago, went on the road, and there's no way that LSU should have hung in that game against uh, uh, the Tide that night. And they did. It was a sloppy game, thanks to thanks to Bama. But, you know, Johnson was, was making plays. He was, Here's the thing. He wasn't losing games. But that's what you want in a guy that's not the starter, right? Uh, you're right. You're going to have a drop-off. There's been a drop-off from Hooker to Milton, and – uh, but not a not a not one that's losing games for them. They're, they've the Vols when they've lost, they've played one really bad half of football. Uh, for for A and M, you're right. There's just a different way that you can point to, and it's still a, a talented roster. That's what I look at. So, and I was I was high on the Aggies to begin the preseason. Uh, whenever we last chatted, I I felt like they were the the surprise team and surprising everyone, but there in in, in College Station. Because we weren't talking about them. It was very similar to the way we weren't talking about Kentucky going into this year or, or last year for that matter. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm still indifferent on the direction of the program because I saw what happened during the COVID year, which is very impressive. Uh, they should have been in the playoff that year. And from there to now, 
it's been uh, quite the journey. And I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't really pinpoint one exact area as to why they fall in the way they have when they should be a lot better. And you know, Jimbo's resume, it, it speaks for itself, but the resume currently is not all that great. Jonathan, how did Tennessee become this defensive juggernaut? Like that, <laughs> that front, man. They're top twenty-five in that in that in their area. It's, it's uh, uh, they've got Pierce now who can rush the passer. Uh, it's it's bizarre because they they've kind of flip flopped on the offensive efficiency versus what they're doing defensively. And it starts up front, and the the juggernaut is you know you've got to string together some games, but it starts with with exactly that. And they've they've done that now. The the mentioned Jimbo's resume. Tennessee's defensive re- resume is good. They've allowed uh, less points than Alabama uh, has allowed. Uh, they match up this week. I, I, uh, I, I still want to see more to truly believe it, but they're aggressive on the edges, and their pass rush has been good, and they're very stout. They, they fight. They battle in the trenches, and it, it still goes back to it. In this league, that's how you win games in the SEC. You still pinpoint – what's going on at the line of scrimmage. Tennessee's been winning that battle. And for the most part, they've been able to run the football well when they want to. And they, while they lack the receiving playmakers that they had a year ago, they're getting enough in that area to be consistently on the winning side of things. So they play well off their defense, which is something that was not the case last year. I mean, the Bama-Tennessee matchup from last year to this year I feel like is exactly the other side of the coin. It's the old school Bama Tennessee game instead of what we saw last year, which was one of the best football games I've ever seen. So can Tennessee score enough on the road to beat Alabama considering Joe Milton hasn't been bad, but they can't there's some he just he's inaccurate, man. I'm telling you, man, you're you're right. Uh he's he's inaccurate and inconsistent in that area. He is also capable of having the game of his life. Like, uh, I feel like he does that every preseason, every camp where he has the the practice week of his life and hypo. I mean, he beat out Hooker the first time. Um, and it was because he came in and in 17 days just was rolling. And the, the athleticism is there. Uh, he's got to have a lot of help around him. Like, they just need to have a perfect crisp day offensively. Um, but Milton is capable of that. Um, and, and if he plays his top game, Tennessee's going to win that game. Now, I, I, I'm not betting on that. I'm not. Uh, I've seen enough of Joe Milton to know that it, you'll you'll take just consistent and very good, not great, over trying to decide whether or not which game he's going to have because there's there, there's no rhyme or reason to it. But he's he's certainly capable of leading a team for a week. Is it this week? Probably not, based on the fact that this is a game that Saban preps for uh, weeks in advance. Uh, The Tennessee book is always on his desk anytime he's doing some sit down with a media member. Yeah, I I think they have they have a way of uh, confusing, uh, bogeying, disguising that he may not see at other SEC programs for the most part on the SEC schedule. I I think in this case, they, they do some confusion for him. And we'll see how he plays. Defensively, though, Tennessee's been good. And Bama's offense, uh, if they're going to move the football, eventually they're going to have a penalty that brings it back because that's the that's how the the roll tide the, the tide rolls, right? Like they the 14, 15 penalties a game is now the routine. And that's also bizarre uh saying that from a saving coach team. But that's they've been doing that. They do, do they have the quarterback to bail them out? Milrow's been good since he was benched. I'm still not sold on that either. This is just which which quarterback is capable of raising the game a bit? Is it Milrow or Milton? And and to me, that's a coin flip. It should be a good game like last year. I think it's tight, but it's low scoring. I don't watch Milton close enough to know this side of him, but it seemed to me when he got out and ran, he took great pride in making contact with the A and M defenders, where he would yeah. he would talk a little smack. Is that typical of him? Yep, and he's got the size to kind of wear it, right? Um, First game I saw him play at Neyland was his was the season opener for him first start, and he was uh, he wasn't shy to contact, but the way he took hits, he allowed the defender to bring the contact first. Like he took the brunt of it, and I think he's 
over the last year or so changed that physical nature of how he runs. He's built. I mean, he's he's a big guy. Um, he's he's not Cam Newton is, but he's I mean he's that same size and and build and frame. So I, I think that benefits him, and uh, they want to get him on the move. Uh, but they also want him to stand in the pocket and be fast with the football. And they need to, you know, when they need to go fast, sometimes New York this year, I feel like they've gone slow. And when I feel like they're going fast, there there are times where I'm like, slow it down a bit. And it's been uh, a bit of a hodgepodge to figure out this group. But I think in part, that's personnel that Heifel's having to adjust to and, and a new offensive coordinator for that matter. But so far, things have gone a about as expected with Milton, where it's not a Heisman type candidacy, but it's also not just a, a, a complete drop off from what they had. And part of that is just he's he's running, and he's also you know lowering the shoulder or bending down and delivering the hit. Hooker was the opposite. Hooker was also a very good runner, but he knew when to get down. Milton more or less wants to uh, invite the contact. As we know, college football changes week to week, and you know the sky's falling, yada, yada, yada. LSU, <laughs> their season looked like it was going to go one direction, and it feels at least right now that the arrow is pointing back up. Do you think the arrow is pointing back up? I do. Um, I mean, th- there's, a, there's a scenario where they get to nine wins. They're guaranteed, I believe, seven now. And uh, that's with the, I think they split the the four games that they have coming up in some general fashion. They've got Missouri and Kentucky, but also Bama and Georgia. And uh, of course, Vandy as well. I I think they get to seven there and then can they, with Vandy and then their non-conference UConn, can they get uh, two more games of those four and then possibly win a 10th in a bowl game? That, That is a... I mean, coming off of an 11 win season, um, that that's great for Heifel in, in recruiting. He's been doing well in that area. They develop talent well. They know who they are and what they're about. Uh, there's there's a buy in there. there. There's no disconnect between the the program uh, and the offices to what they're doing on the practice field or what they're doing on game day. I like the direction uh, that they're headed. They're they're on that path. And there hasn't been a, a, a considerable amount of adjustment, so to speak, because they have some young guys stepping up, especially defensively. What game are you going to have your eyes on this week and maybe outside of the SEC? Ohio State, Penn State, uh, Texas, U of H. Uh, where, where, are you, where are you leaning? Yeah, te- Texas is very intriguing because I, I want to see, uh, to me, Texas, Oklahoma, they're going to have a rematch and the winner gets in the playoff because I think both teams – uh, meet there and then I, I just feel like the conference championship games are going to have a, a, a more weight to them than usual uh, than than past years um, but yeah it's it's Ohio State Penn State only because it's not it, ticket prices are absurd but they're always abs- absurd in Columbus it's the, I don't really know the Big Ten right now the, the the top three and then there's a considerable drop off from four to twelve and and I'm I'm thinking to myself, okay, where where do we slot the top three? And if if this is the if James Franklin's going to have a, a a staircase climb, this is the year to do it. And they've done it on the road as much as they possibly could with uh, Aller, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see the matchup there. Um, and they'll have to do it on the road here. And then Michigan, Michigan has been dominant. I'm not taking anything away from them. I, th- are they one of the top four? Absolutely. Um, have I seen a lot of them? No. I mean, I, because of their schedule. So we, it takes a while. We got to wait for a few more weeks for that to, to play out. So this determines kind of the pecking order of Michigan and the, who's the next team. And then Michigan will have to end up proving it too. I, I also think Penn state, Ohio state, the, the, if everyone splits and every has one loss by the end of it with Michigan and the, the other two, I'm intrigued to see what happens in the conference championship game with that versus what could happen in the, in the PAC 12. So yeah, the magnitude of the win loss here is big, just like it was for USC losing to Notre Dame. So uh, Billy's giving me a hard time for using Texas and U of H as the game that I used. And I'm looking through, there aren't a lot of marquee games, but the one I probably should have gone with was Duke and Florida state. Florida state to me, I still have them in my top four. Um, Washington is uh, cracking away. They're, they're chipping away at, at the resume for Florida State now. Um, 
And, and that's just in my own head trying to piece together what I think the committee will do. Brock Bowers going down, and the assumption is he's coming back in a few weeks. I don't know why Brock Bowers would come back, uh, given the fact he's a two-time national champion. But that, that, is a, that is a huge loss for Georgia, and that opens up the landscape too, not just in the SEC, but for teams trying to compare themselves to the, the, the top of the, the college football world. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the, 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 the impact of uh, college football in general. Duke is a great one. Because Duke is far more talented than just a quarterback and uh, certainly capable of beating Florida State. But Florida State just needs to stay right on track. What a huge loss for Miami, by the yeah. way, a couple of weeks ago. And North Carolina, I'm not sleeping on Drake May. Uh, just continue doing what they're doing and see what happens at the end of the line. That the ACC is intriguing because they're kind of the outlier for all of the great storylines right now in college football because we're not going to see the top teams play each other for a bit. Jonathan, I appreciate you. Got to hit a break there, man. Thanks so much. Okay. Always great, man. Anytime. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Jonathan Hutton there. Outkick the coverage. Great work, uh, as he always does. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with a final short segment. Sex Hacks. We're up against it. Ethan Jones with us with uh, some stats to consider. Ethan, take yeah. it away, buddy. So obviously, bad offensive performance. One of the worst of our season, actually. Here's some stats that show that. Uh, Texas A&M only had 277 total yards 
in 4.47 yards per play. This is the first time this season that Texas A&M has not reached the threshold of, threshold of at least 300 total yards or five yards per play. We only ran for 54 yards, lowest of the season, and 1.93 yards per carry. So that's absolutely terrible. Max Johnson had a 47.1 completion percentage, which is also terrible. So both running and passing was bad. Also, we also was bad on the offensive line too. Tex A&M, all O-line allowed Max Johnson to be pressured on 25 of his 39 dropbacks, which is 64% and 11 QB hits. We were also really bad on third downs. 33%, which is our tied lowest rate this season, and 0 of 2 on fourth downs. So bad on fourth down, third downs, all around really bad on offense. But this is kind of becoming a trend against ranked opponents. So the two ranked opponents we played this year, Bama and Tennessee, we've done really bad on offense. So here's a, some stats that compare our unranked games. We have 15 seconds. Games. Okay, we'll get the biggest one is so there's red zone trips ending in touchdowns. Unranked, we did 62.5% into touchdowns, ranked 28.6% and in touchdowns. Thank you, Ethan. Appreciate that. All right, that's going to do it for Tech Sags Radio on a Tuesday. We'll see you manana.